Hello everyone, a bandit here, and today I'll be reviewing Australian Survivor's Blood vs. Water season that recently just finished. The season overall has been quite controversial in the community for a variety of reasons, and even though I personally have posted just a few videos relating to this season, even I have my issues with some of the decisions made during Blood vs. Water. But nevertheless, let's hop into the video. We begin with the intro to Blood vs. Water that outlines the previous season, Brains vs. Bronze, and the eventual winner, Healy. While I do like them paying respect to their previous season and its winner, this correlates to the same issue I had with Survivor 42, showing Survivor 41 in its intro as new viewers will have an entire season spoiled for them. After this, we get some beautiful cinematic shots of the terrain, which is a massive boon for Australian Survivor as a whole. The episodes really do have this attractive feel, thanks to the incredible photography work of the environment. The episode begins with an introduction to the brothers, Jesse and Jordy, with a fantastic line of, if you're choosing someone to bring to battle, you'd pick Jesse, and if you were picking who to bring to the pub, you'd pick me. And such a humorous comment like this already makes Australian Survivor, in just a few minutes, have more humour in it than the entirety of Survivor 41. Overall, this is a fairly strong intro for these brothers, which end up becoming the strongest duo edit-wise out of all the newbie pairs. We then get an intro to Croc, which outlines him as a former rugby player, but unlike former sportsmen in previous seasons, like Simon Black or Gavin Wanigan, he seems to understand Survivor more. This led me and others to wonder if Croc could end up like this Matt Roger figure who dominated champions versus contenders and production seemed very impressed with Matt. We also get an introduction to KJ and Sophie where they show off zoom footage between them and what I can assume is the casting director asking them questions. This scene feels very reminiscent to Tiffany's intro package in Survivor 41 where she's hugging her husband and gives us this behind the scenes vibe. Nonetheless, I am very appreciative of this small insight into the preseason interview process and effectively starts the ball rolling on Sophie's episode 1 content. Then we get to the return of Andy, and I do like his intro package of referencing champions versus contenders too, and his defining move in targeting David beyond the grave. Something I even talked about in my Australian Survivor Most Ingenious Move series. That being said, it was very bizarre seeing Andy on this cast. Not because he wasn't a worthy returnee, in fact I'm a strong advocate for saying he should have been on All Stars, but it seemed like he was innately screwed coming into this season. Again, the fact he was one of the four attorneys, with the other three being Mark and Sam, and the other being Sandra, the two-time queen of Survivor, he felt like a very out-of-place pick. Personally, I'd rather have had Benji and Annalise return in the slot as siblings, since again, Andy on the cast with his sister was very jarring. We also get Mark and Sam introduced, which really are the cream of the crop for a Blood vs. Water season. Again, two individuals that literally got married because of the show. And again, when you compare the gravitas of this story, uh, Sandra, the two-time winner of Survivor, and her daughter, and then Andy Meldrum and his sister. One of these is not like the others. It was also sweet seeing how they now have what we would refer to in Northern Ireland as a wee one, and this son is referenced a lot in later episodes. But then, after we cover these three returnee stories, we then get to an airport in this over-the-top style with Sandra getting her passport stamped. This then leads to some humorously staged scene where there's this massive helicopter flying through the sky only for Sam to ask, do I hear something? The helicopter then lands at the top of this rocky hill where Sandra opens the door and is revealed. In response to this we have Chrissy saying is that Oprah, which despite being very funny, gives us as the viewer all the knowledge we need to know about Chrissy's survivor IQ. 
as if Chrissy's comment hadn't killed the gravitas of the scene, watching Nina and Sandra slowly shuffle down the rocky hill with them awkwardly having to make their way down does. I do feel bad for Sandra as for someone who tries to play so under the radar, arriving on a chopper just further expands the target on your back. It's also really confusing to me that they did this with Sandra, considering with Russell Hans and Luke Toki on Champions for his Contenders 2, they were instantly recognised as well, and are legends on the show, but had normal entrances and means of transport, which I feel is far more fair and less over the top to the viewer. While I didn't love her entrance, her intro package was really well made in my opinion, and does a great job of paying respect to her legacy. We have scenes from Pearl Islands, Heroes vs Villains and even Game Changers. At this stage I'm fully expecting Boston Rob to appear on Season 9 of the Australian Survivor season. Sandra and Nina then get addressed as they scale the rock wall down. Andy awkwardly raises Sandra's arm as she's announced as the two-time winner. JLP also asks Nina a leading question about if she's going to let her mother take the crown for a third time, to which she gives a smart response by saying she'll quote, play it by year. After this pre-game ramble, we then get Jonathan announcing they're going to be put on tribes, but they will all be competing against each other, which weirdly seems to be a massive shock to the cast. Again, I thought the expectation of a blood versus water season would be that you're on one tribe and your loved one were on another, like in season 27 or 29 of Survivor US. Like we get Mark saying they thought him and Sam were playing together, uh, Kate also says that she's worried for Andy because they were going to work together and that without me his social game is gone, which is a massive red flag for me in relation to Andy's chances at doing well in the game. The first challenge is a throwback to Champions vs Contenders slip and slide, which they did during their marooning. However, this time they're sliding into a pool of water where they have to bring a hook to their post, like in Winners at War. And I really don't like this as a marooning challenge for the season, as the matchups were duo locked. For example, half of the duos were male and female, making it really unfair for the female halves of the duo, considering it was such a physical challenge. We begin with Jordan and Jesse, wherein Jesse has this fun line about how he can't afford to lose to Jordy, only to get molly whopped by him. So we get into our matchup between Chrissy and Croc, and I mean, Croc is obviously going to win. That being said, Chrissy, especially at the start, was winning several exchanges with Croc, which made me wonder if Croc was trying to appear weaker than he actually was, because he should have been able to destroy Chrissy. There's a few other matchups like KJ vs Sophie, Andy vs Kate, but really the ultimate matchup is Sandra vs her daughter Nina, and I love how Jonathan refers to her as princess as if things weren't over the top enough. I also find it humorous that as they're literally only sliding down, Jonathan yells out he knows the Queen doesn't like challenges, which was a random savage moment. Nonetheless, as expected, Nina beats out Sandra and wins the reward for her tribe. We get to the Water Tribes camp, and just the name Water Tribe is funny to me, as it's very obvious throughout the entirety of the season that Jonathan just does not like calling them Blood and Water Tribe, and instead refers to them as the Red and Blue Tribe. We get content from Chrissy about not really knowing what's going on, but the main content surrounds Andy, where there are a lot of cuts to him in these group shots. He has this really hilarious confessional where he said if I had to describe my strategy in one word bearing in mind one word it would be Mike Tyson which very obviously were the editors just merging his confessionals together to make him look bad but I also find it funny because here in the UK we have Love Island where good looking generally lower IQ individuals are cast and so when they're asked three words to describe themselves then end up saying like 10. We also get other scenes clearly merged together to make Andy look bad, such as him addressing that he actually plays golf, which then cuts to another scene of the tribe in deadpan silence. This is then followed up by Mark, the other returnee, and I find it interesting that they split the two returning males onto one tribe, and the two returning females on the other, rather than one and one on each tribe. Nonetheless, Mark states Andy, Andy's Andy, and does a good job at laying low and letting Andy take charge of the shelter building. 
And overall, I was very happy to see Mark and Sam back, as although I didn't find them the most entertaining of individuals in their initial season, I did feel like they had the potential to win the game. After this content on the Water Tribe, we get to the Blood Tribe where instantly everyone is fanboying and fangirling over Sandra, and I particularly loved it when she was questioned, what's Rupert like? We also get Sandra outlining the differences between Australian Survivor and US Survivor, such as how it's more physical based, and she later refers to the Australians on the show as loving their blind sides, which is great to see. When you're at the stage Sandra is at in Survivor, where essentially you are the game, I imagine it could be rather easy to not feel like studying Australian Survivor, but she clearly did, and it's nice to see. We then get Sophie's personal intro packages outlining her as this strong independent woman with a strong company behind her which instantly made me feel like Janine-esque vibes towards her. Overall, I think you can tell Australian Survivor has begun having its own mini diversity mandate because the casting seems far more diverse even in comparison to the last season, Brains vs Brawn. We then get back to the Water Tribe, where Shay and Brianna are shown to bond, which forms a strong base for this episode, and even the one after. Overall, Shay gets some very strong content, but considering her placement, it's rather strange to me the strong content doesn't continue through the season much. Shay then also finds a note which outlines that there is a live idol on the podium at Tribal, and this is cool to see. She then tells Brianna immediately about this advantage. This obviously isn't new, as this advantage has been seen in South Africa, Philippines, and even in All Stars had something similar, with Henry needing to find his idol at Tribal. This, however, isn't the only clue, and Chrissy, of all people, finds the other one, and it is quite funny how, because she knows so little about the show, she somewhat breaks the fourth wall by saying, I knew this was good, I'm not stupid. She then proceeds to open what she calls her love letter from Jonathan, and Chrissy really does offer a lot of entertainment plus humour for the first episode, and even though she is extremely confused about just about everything, because again, I have no idea why, she didn't watch Survivor before she came out. We get Jonathan calling come on into the tribes, and this phrase seems to stay the same throughout the season, meaning Survivor Australia has also followed Survivor US, on its removal of the word guys. Well, I could talk about the good and bad of the removal of the term come on in guys. I do like that they made the change without having to designate a scapegoat like what Survivor US did in season 41 with Ricard. We also get this very jarring scene of Alex literally being picked up by his tribe and carried to the mat after injuring his back off screen before the challenge. He seemed in a lot of pain, and it was just odd that we got literally zero context before the challenge about this. We then get a bit of back and forth between Chrissy and Croc on their tribes. Because Alex was so badly injured, they were forced to sit him out of the challenge, resulting in the Blood Tribe having to pick someone to sit out on their side. I find it rather bizarre on the Blood Tribe that Jordan volunteers to sit out, Considering firstly, it's a very physical challenge and he himself is a very strong individual who literally is a personal trainer and he literally goes on to win individual challenges later in the season. This is when Croc steps up and really seems like the leader of his tribe. He backs up Jordan saying he doesn't want him to sit out and this causes Kate to be benched. At the challenge, Red have a strong lead and it's surprising that with strong individuals on their tribe like Mark, Jordy, Can, Shay, Josh and even Nina, that the Blue Tribe were completely gassed at the second wall and just couldn't break it. While it seems to be the overall tribe that struggles with the challenge, a lot of attention is placed on Chrissy, inquiring about being able to have a break for a few seconds, which obviously isn't a good look for her. Eventually, essentially because of Mark Soley, the tribe manages to break down the wall, but because they were so far behind, they weren't able to catch up to the Red Tribe, which wins the challenge after Sophie gets a cool cinematic shot of hitting the urn. While I was expecting Andy to be the first boot this episode, the Alex situation definitely made predicting the first boot harder. Back at the water camp, Alex is laid down at the shelter, and even though he gets minimal content throughout the season, I do feel bad for him, as the injury did seem rather painful. 
However, this is when we're introduced to Chrissy and Alex having this mother and son bond, where Chrissy says she's adopted him and wants to shift the target onto someone else. We also get Andy with the rest of the tribe in the water, where he's talking about needing to vote someone out, and I like how Jody flips it around on Alex to ask him who he would like gone. To this, Andy responds, Alex, and interestingly states in his confessional, he can expect up to 10 votes on Alex, which makes it seem like they're aware of Chrissy and Alex as a duo. Brianna and Shay then get content talking about the idol, and I find it odd that Shay's leg is wrapped up in bandages, yet the show doesn't address it, and Brianna even asks Shay directly if she can run while pointing to Shay's injury. The two girls talk about targeting Chrissy due to her poor challenge performance, but they have to beat her to the idol to ensure they can vote her out. Perhaps the most impactful conversation happens between Mark and Nina, however, where they weigh up voting for Alex, but Mark says, I feel like he'd be the easy vote, but not the right vote, which Nina agrees with. Overall, Nina does a very good job in this conversation and pacifies Mark. She also catches Mark slipping up and saying he's afraid of Andy, and pursues that in order to get the vote onto Andy. The show does a lot to showcase this move as Nina's move. Alex also gets a small bit of content moving forward, and honestly he reminds me of a season 1 Connor through injuring himself, being on the bottom of the tribe, and he just has the same look to him. Chrissy's cluelessness shows again by her asking we've to write something downright, which is just asinine, considering the entire premise of the show is to write someone's name down on a parchment. Brianna also gets a lot of content talking about the advantage, which I find bizarre from a storytelling perspective, considering it was Shay who found it. Sure, you could argue it sets up the Brianna versus Chrissy rivalry down the line, but considering Shay has tenfold the longevity in the game, this would have been a great opportunity to gain some insight from Shay. And it's really because of moments like this where Shay should have been getting content but never does, which made me never consider as having winner contention. We get to Tribal and quickly the combination of Chrissy, Brianna and Shay are looking for the idol intently and I adore this editing. While the editing of players this season has been awful, the sound design has been great and I love the fast heartbeats that play as the tension rises. It really has the viewer on the edge of their seat as they wonder who will get the idol first. So, after a few questions, Shay leaves her seat and does a fast walk towards the idol, which prompts Chrissy to jump out of her seat. Brianna then instinctively pushes her away while seated in her seat, which I don't think is allowed, but Chrissy manages to break free from her and races towards the podium, all while Brianna is calling for Shay because she ran to the wrong spot. Eventually, Chrissy comes out on top and gets the idol. Throughout this entire scene, I love Andy's face, which is completely dumbfounded at what is happening. After getting the idol, Brianna begins calling out Chrissy, albeit because Jonathan was probing her with questions, and Chrissy seems to be receiving heat at the rest of this tribal council for having the public idol. Nonetheless, the vote begins, and I love the return of the Brains vs. Brawn music. Turmoil is one of my favourite tracks of all time, including the US's soundtrack. After the votes are tallied, Jonathan asks if anyone has an idol to play, and Chrissy plays the idol on herself. Now this may look like a stupid move from Chrissy to play the idol on herself at the very first tribal, but this idol was only usable the first tribal, and even if that rule wasn't in place, it's better for her to burn it rather than give incentive for the majority to split on her in the next rounds. We get a vote for Brianna, later revealed to be from Alex weirdly, two votes on Alex, but ultimately Andy gets the remainder of the votes and is eliminated. And I really enjoyed Andy during this season, despite his one episode stint. I just feel like with his legacy of being a snake in season 4, plus the fact he was in such an odd returnee slot as Sandra, Nina, Mark and Sam were such better shields than him, really hurt him. While I enjoy Andy, I don't think this was the right season to see his return, evidently, as he got a pretty raw deal. Had there been a few other previous Australian Survivor non-All-Star players like Tessa, Elle, 
Baden, Benji, or Ziggy return with a loved one, just to name a few, then that would have helped Andy feel less like such a random casting choice. I do suspect the producers brought him and his chaotic gameplay style back after seeing the success of George on Brains vs. Bronze, but unfortunately it wasn't meant to be. I do feel bad for Andy though, as such a super fan must suck not making the jury twice in a row. Overall, this was a good episode, although like most Australian Survivor seasons, I really struggled to remember who was who. We begin episode 2 with more yoga scenes, always fun, and Chrissy again delivering such a dry joke about Shay in that she can stand on one toe and I can't even stand on my own two legs, although this did serve to set up the tension between Chrissy and Shay. We return to the Blood Tribe where Sophie gets the time to explain the tribe's dynamics in needing fire but being unable to do so. However, thanks to David, the tribe eventually gets fire where Sophie gets more content talking about how they never thought they'd be able to do it and how great of a moment it was. No one else really gets this content around this scene, even David who, you know, made the fire. We then get to see Kate worried for Andy and saying, I'm scared now we're going to walk in and Andy's not going to be there. We then get back to the Water Tribe where Alex's back seems to have improved as he's able to stand up and Nina is given the time to break down the tribe. However, she ends on Khan who she says she doesn't know how to feel about yet, which starts not only this conflict between Nina and Khan, but also this episode becomes Khan's welcome party to the season, where he is highlighted as a major social threat. Brianna also gets her personal intro package, followed by a conversation with Chrissy, where Chrissy comes off as rather dismissive towards her, and we conclude this scene with the two just awkwardly nodding at one another, although I suspect this part was edited to make it look more awkward than it actually was. We get into the reward challenge, with Alex being able to walk, and it was strange to me that we never got him talking about being able to walk, either in a confessional or asked by JP. Kate also gets to see the new tribe without Andy and of course is asked by Jonathan how she feels. Her response was good in my opinion as she plays it up for the camera while also appearing as understanding to the other tribe. The challenge itself was a pretty cool idea with it being a combination of physical and strategy where the players had to climb on nets to escape a cage. The Water Tribe win the challenge thanks to Khan getting the game winning shot and I find it so cringy that they awfully edited Jonathan saying Khan is a beast over him swimming in the water after getting the tribe's flag. We see the Water Tribe giving up the comfort but keeping the fishing gear as part of the sharing is caring dilemma which is a fun little twist to include on the season and again it seemed like the tribes were struggling out there so the Water Tribe likely felt bad for their loved ones. We then get back to the Water Tribe where Nina outlines the reward challenge and the reward itself being the fishing gear. Nita then talks about the fact that she knows on these rewards there are hidden compartments that could contain idols and idol clues, which again shows a good level of understanding in relation to Australian Survivor. Khan also gets a confessional about trying to be under the radar and silently pulling the strings, which adds further validity to Nina's concerns of Khan being a threat. Due to the fishing gear having a potential advantage, Brianna hogs it and begins searching every compartment for an advantage, which although a good strategic move because she could find an idol clue, isolates her further from the tribe and everyone can see what she is doing by hogging the fishing supplies. On the Blood Tribe we get Kate content, on the Blood Tribe we get Kate content which really highlights her social awareness. She can see others talking without her resulting in her saying the line, if you're not part of the plan you are the plan, and although this is good content from Kate from this point on, I was convinced she wasn't going to be in the game for much longer due to the fact her and Andy were set up as this duo that covered each other's weaknesses. Without Andy having the strategy and experience to aid the duo, it seemed like all Kate had to offer was her social game. This then leads to Sam, who was less shown in the edit than her husband Mark in the previous episode, but this time she gets her personal intro package, talking about herself as an endurance athlete on top of respecting her legacy with season 2 flashbacks. And to be honest, this content on top of later variables I'll be talking about later, made me have Sam as my winner pick for the majority of the season. 
While Mark got more content in episode 1, Sam still got an intro shared with him and continues to get a lot of content throughout the season. We also get some other fun moments such as Croc asking Sandra if people get paranoid often on Survivor, which I find to be a very wholesome scene as this massive grizzly beast of a man is asking Sandra for game insight. For the immunity challenge, we got a pretty physically demanding immunity challenge requiring barrels and it was fun seeing Sandra competing. Once again, the Blood Tribe win immunity, resulting in the Water Tribe having to go back to Tribal. We return to the Water Tribe where Chrissy and Brianna's rivalry is in full swing. Something I also find interesting over the course of this episode is that they seem to try really hard in disassociating Shay and Brianna. Chrissy then confirms the majority as herself, Mark, Josh, Mel, Jordy and King Khan, which is ironic to me considering we as the viewer don't know who half of these people are at this point. We then have this very obvious cut with Khan, Shay and Brianna where Bri asks who is the vote with silence and then Khan responds I don't know which makes it obvious Brianna will be the boot of the episode. Chrissy also gets this interesting confessional where she says Brianna came in way too hard and put a target on her back which is a fairly information rich phrase for someone who has never seen the show. We see Brianna trying to rally the troops but her argument comes off as very self interested which isn't a great look for someone clearly on the bottom. However Shay finds an idle clue and after gathering the mechanism to get it out of the tree, kind of like in Ko Rong, she tries to get the idol loose. Unfortunately, the mechanism is really long and therefore really heavy, requiring Khan, Jordi, Nina and Brianna and some others to help assist her. After dislodging the idol from the tree, Khan darts forward and grabs the idol. Now I've talked about this move in greater detail on episode 1 of my Australian Survivor Most Ingenious Move series, but I think this is an excellent move that allows Khan to publicly raise Shay's threat level while showing his loyalty to her, while also ensuring Brianna, someone clearly self-interested, doesn't grab the idol and hold onto it for herself. Brianna attempts to use the situation as a way to gain majority due to the teamwork they demonstrated, but considering even postseason, I can't 100% to make out who was all involved in this idol hunt scene, it felt very much like Brianna's fate was sealed. We then get even more can content outlining to Shay why he gave her the idol and his thoughts on the situation, which was strong strategic gameplay and really made me think he was going to be one of these celebrities that do surprisingly well on the show placement and gameplay wise. After the idol find, we get this extremely broken confessional from Chrissy saying if Shay plays her idol for Brianna, I'm gone. And one of my biggest issues with this season is this over-reliance on what I refer to as zombie confessionals, where they clearly take a few words from a confessional and then another few words from another confessional to make a new confessional that fits the storyline production are trying to make. The issue is, to a viewer like me anyway, if a confessional is broken up as badly as this, I know they've had to make a postseason, which again makes it readily apparent to me this wasn't a concern of Chrissy's actually on the island. So again, I was confident we were going to see a Brianna boot and Shay will never play the idol on her. At Tribal, we get some more Brianna screen time where she talks about the merits of keeping her. As the tribe gets up to vote, we get this full on cinematic hero music rather than the background music we normally get, which although more cinematic than Survivor US, still had a tribal theme to it. I mean, this music sounds like the Water Tribe were about to be launched into space for an adventure. As the votes are revealed, it's 9-2 elimination on Brianna, and it's interesting seeing Mark voting for Chrissy, considering they're supposed to be in an alliance. It was never clarified why he did so in the edit, and also they didn't split the vote on Brianna and Shay like I expected. Perhaps the majority was okay with sacrificing Chrissy, which falls in line with Mark voting Chrissy, but it just seemed rather dangerous to not put three votes on Shay. After all, she knows she's on the bottom of the tribe even after this episode, but Shay votes for Brianna and keeps the idol like Khan wanted. And I like Brianna on the show, although I felt like this early game was going to be an extremely difficult spot for her to overcome, as so many young women in their 20s go out around this stage. Despite being the second boot of the season, she's honestly one of the characters I can tell you more about, which 
honestly speaks volumes for how poorly the other cast members are edited. But she was fun and entertaining, which is what you want out of a Survivor contestant. It's very clear she was the super fan and her father was a tag along, which is interesting considering the next episode. In episode 3 we get a funny moment of Khan carving B into a stick, only to ask why they're doing so, and for him to be reminded it's because they voted out Brianna. The joke is then made that they should do the entire alphabet as they also had down A for Andy. This would result in C being next and because Chrissy is the only one in camp with C as the first letter of their name, we have her hilariously remarking no. And in comparison to Survivor 41 which basically had no humour, this season was far brighter with scenes like these making the show a more enjoyable product overall. We can then get another moment of the contestants breaking the fourth wall, where Khan and Jordy jokingly remark about Brianna not actually being voted out, and instead on a random island, which is obviously jabbing at the show for liking to have these sudden twists, where the person the contestants voted out wouldn't actually leave the game. We then get a lot of King Khan content, with him approaching Mark about being an undercover strategic duo, which overall I find to be good gameplay, as someone like Khan having a shield in Mark would allow him to move through the game more effectively. Mark seems to like this idea, and even calls him the king of the camp, while saying he's keeping an eye on him. We then get to the Blood Tribe after some crocodile imagery, which really had been and will continue to be used a lot throughout the season, and because Australian Survivor can be on the nose with its winners, Pia saying she's the first boot who will win anyone, I felt this crocodile lurking under the water and coming out to attack would be foreshadowing for Croc doing the same in this game. That prediction crashed and burned, however. I feel like production let slip to David that Brianna was the boot because we get so much talk about him and Camp and his confessionals suddenly being very paranoid that Brianna was voted out. Lo and behold, at the challenge the Blood Tribe get to see the new Water Tribe with Brianna voted out. And I did feel bad for David here as you can see he was on the verge of tears. During the challenge, the tribes have to get two pontoons back to land and gather sandbags, and I find it hilarious that for the second pontoon, Mark and Josh are arguing about who is the second swimmer, Jordy steps up and then begins to swim with his determination, only to remember after a few seconds that he forgot the rope. I feel like this challenge was better in theory than practice because we just get people lifting sandbags for the rest of the challenge which isn't the most interesting of TV. The Blood Tribe win this challenge but after it's announced that only one person can visit the survivor shop they really seem confused on who to pick to go. People suggest Jesse but Jesse suggests Ben who then in conjunction with Kate seems to land on Sandra. So Sandra raises her hand, but Sam cuts them off suggesting going for Dave because he just lost his partner and so the tribe rally behind her and pick David. This was a smart move from the tribe, even though I've seen people saying the opposite. Firstly, David just lost his loved one, so he's far less likely to work with the water tribe and also he has very little survivor knowledge. Therefore, he's less likely to get an advantage, and if he does get an advantage, it will be easier to get the information out of him. The Blood Tribe then have to pick someone from the opposite tribe, to which David picks Khan because he quote, can trust him. Ironic considering Khan was a major piece in voting his daughter out. As the two go out to the shop, we get this dramatic imagery of a man with a spear merged into the water, foreshadowing this trip leading to some conflict in which it definitely does. The two get to look around the store at all the lovely sponsored items, and then they come across a super idol. And I really don't like how these two are just handed an idol, with each having the caveat of being a super idol when the two halves are combined, compared to Chrissy, who had to fight Shay and Brianna for a public idol, the first episode, which could only be played at the first Tribal Council. 
This idol, as well as the option to split the reward with the guest, seemed to make it so the two would bond and form an intertribal relationship, but that's not what David does. Even when offered information in exchange for an item, David denies Khan and really comes off as inflexible, which is a really bad quality in a game like Survivor. And while David definitely picks up his game in the later stretch of the season, he really screws himself up in this round. The situation between them is very awkward all thanks to David and really burns Khan as without having an item, they both know he's going to be labelled as extremely suspicious when going back to camp. Ultimately, they both agree and try to work together to make the super idol, but if one of them has to use the idol to lower their hat at the next challenge. Khan is shown returning to camp first and straight up admits to his tribe he has an idol, which I don't think is awful considering it shows him as a trustworthy person and saying he had nothing would have been met with suspicion. He also has the added advantage of his idol being half of a super idol, which none of the tribe knew about and I suspect Khan was so willing to reveal the idol he had because of this power he could keep secret. David returns to camp and while he has a pretty strong start during the interrogation, by adding some much needed humour to his statements, he's eventually asked if he found nothing during the reward could can, which then causes him to completely fall apart through consistent stuttering and having an extremely weak response. Sandra even identifies this in her confessional and begins to eye David as a target as a result. At the immunity challenge we have Jay sitting out which is rather bizarre considering how fit he is. Jonathan also calls out Mark for slipping and labels it as a huge setback, ironic since it literally cost the tribe about 10 seconds, and Croc completely demolishes the wood cutting portion of this challenge. Sandra's challenge weakness is also highlighted in this challenge, to the point Blood's eventual loss seems to be on Sandra, at least portrayed by the edit. When Blood gets back to camp, David really shows a surprising level of strategy and authority by getting a split vote together on Sandra and Kate, but this plan was pretty early in the episode, resulting in a lot of time for the vote to be flipped, and the flipper of the vote comes in the form of Ben, who wants to keep around Sandra as a shield for him, which makes perfect sense, considering as a big guy he needs someone as a bigger threat than him to get eliminated over him, just before the merge. Because we've seen with Craig, Heath and Simon, the strong men really find danger just before the merge. So Ben spills the plan to Sandra about David's split vote plan, which causes Sandra to flip the tribe on David. So we have three options, either David, Sandra or Kate going into tribal. Now many of these pre-vote rambles at Tribal are quite the slog to me due to the fact the questions are quite repetitive and everyone is humming and hawing about their answers because of course they don't want their strategy to be revealed. But this Tribal was amazing thanks to David who really out of nowhere calls out Sam. This is ironic to us as a viewer because we know Sam was close to David and the fact he is trying to pin the blame of his name being out there on her was an awful mistake. It seemed genuinely like the tribe were willing to go along with David's plan but Sam gets justifiably angry with David and begins flipping people onto him. Sam then calls out David saying she and a few others were part of defending David today and this is supported by the tribe making David look even worse. When Jonathan asks for an idol to be played, David stands and plays the idol for himself. The music here is fantastic as the David votes pop up with a feeling like the ticking of a clock growing more and more dramatic as we're waiting for who will receive the rest of the votes. And in admittedly quite an odd vote order, Kate gets eliminated with three votes. While Kate's elimination was a massive shock to people, to be honest, I saw it coming. This episode structure was very reminiscent to Ethan's elimination in Winners of War where we knew just enough about the boot and was referenced just enough that she had make sense as a boot. On top of the fact there were people like Croc and Ben that clearly didn't want to let go of Sandra so early in the game. But Kate was fine, not hugely entertaining, just this very ordinary mum. There was nothing zany about her and she didn't ham things up for the sake of the camera. Because she was so average, she probably ends up as being one of the more forgettable boots on the show. So, 
yeah, that's it. So after three episodes, I felt great about the season, as although the first two vote outs were pretty obvious, the editing was strong and the season had a fun vibe surrounding it. The next episodes aren't as entertaining though, in my opinion. In episode four, we get once again a check-in with Sandra, who perfectly describes the tribal as a three-ring circus. We then get David's apology to her with a specific apology to Sam, but it doesn't seem to have that great of an effect because she talks about how worried she is after David identifying her good social game. Back on the Water Tribe, we have Mark revealing to the rest of the tribe that he made an alliance with Khan and that nobody should be worried if they see them going off for a chat. While this does show Mark is being truthful, if I was being told this as an ally of Mark, I would be completely skeptical of him and I'm rather confused that no one called him out for this behaviour. Khan does talk about wanting to keep his idol in the game so he can combine it with David's, which then segues into the immunity challenge where David drops his hat, giving the signal to Khan he had to play his idol. This really blows for Khan, as now he's stranded with a public idol just a few days after getting the advantage with David. While I do like Jonathan and feel like he's been a great host of Survivor Australia, especially since this is only his seventh season as a host, he does have his flaws and one of them comes in the form of him telling the tribe, it was an interesting tribal last night, wasn't it? Which lets the other tribe know Kate's elimination was caused because of a live tribal or idol play. We saw this a lot in Brains vs. Bronze and unfortunately this tradition continues into this season of Blood vs. Water. We get a very physical reward challenge where each tribe's members start on opposite ends of the course and must ring the bell on the other side. However, it's through hip high water and with it being such a physical challenge, I was worried about the drowning risk. We also get a mark matched up against Croc where Jonathan addresses this as King Kong vs Godzilla. I'm not sure who is King Kong and who is Godzilla in this exchange, but the remark is funny to me anyway. This challenge was very anticlimactic to me however, as all each tribe had to do was touch the rope to win the round, resulting in each person then awkwardly having to walk up the slope and then ring the bell. We also get Khan getting the words come on Shay subtitled as she walks out only for her to lose the challenge. This is interesting considering this may be another piece of negativity towards Khan by alluding to the fact he's shown is in the wrong. I find it funny that another matchup consisted of cousins Josh and Jordan, two individuals with no content at this point in the episode. In fact, if Jonathan never specified they were blood related, I probably would have forgotten. We also get another zombie speech from Jonathan talking about a challenge based Khan only for him to lose to Jesse resulting in him being undermined once again. This causes Blood to win the challenge where Jonathan announces they have to pick one person from the water tribe to share the meal with and almost instantly they pick Shay. While Shay is picked to be on the rewards, we really don't get much content from her which was another knock to me as Ben instead gets all her potential content. We then later get more Sophie content, talking about how she plans to align herself with the big boys on the tribe, consisting of Ben, Jordan and Croc, which I do like as with Australian Survivor being so physical, aligning yourself early with individuals theoretically allows you to skate on by. Although the problem with the theory is that it often is different in practice, and Sandra identifies Sophie as being extremely tight with the big boys, which I give massive credit to her for noticing. At the immunity challenge we get Sandra once again competing, and it is interesting that during both the reward and immunity challenge this season, we get Sandra competing. Potentially it could be her trying to break the stereotype of her being bad at challenges and showing on a Survivor series as physical as Australian Survivor that she can still contribute in challenges. This challenge featured one half being on a boat and collecting puzzle pieces and the second half assembling those blocks to make an arc. The issue is the tribe name, blood or water, had to be spelt on the front facing side and the back facing side, resulting in blood having an innate disadvantage in my opinion as they have to check the O's since blood has two O's. Because of this, Although they're spelling blood correctly on their side, we as the viewer can see on the back side they're instead spelling a bollard on the other side, 
really through no fault of their own, and the fact water doesn't have any repeating letters means they don't have to check behind them like the Red Tribe. We also get Sophie doing some calling from the bench, which is portrayed on the show to be obnoxious and really leads to her satisfying downfall by the end of this episode. The edit also tries to blame Ben for dropping the arch, as when, as far as I could tell, it was Michelle that let go of her block, causing the destruction of the Red Arc. On both tribes, there seem to be designated callers in Mark and Croc. Mark does a very effective job at guiding the water team, and many people on the tribe ask for his assistance to see if the block they are holding is flush. The water tribe also had a lot of mud at the sides of their blocks, which could have been used as them trying to stick the blocks together as part of an ingenious strategy, although I might just be looking into it too much. We also get Sophie coming over to her tribe and asking Jesse what happened at the start, what was wrong, again highlighting the Sophie being bossy storyline. However, after the challenge we suddenly get the announcement that Blue will be able to witness the Blood Tribal Council, which comes out of left field since it was never announced before the challenge and makes it very apparent this episode will be a non-elimination episode. Due to their loss, the Blood Tribe have to go to Tribal again, devote another person out, and immediately were met with even more Sophie content outlining the dynamics of the Tribe, and that they're targeting David because of his blow up the previous Tribal. However, we get back to Sandra who wants to target Sophie because she's controlling the guys, and I really like her confessional about how Sophie doesn't know what she's been doing for XYZ, immediately followed by Sophie saying, you're teaching me, thank you to Ben, which seemed like fun editing, allowing the producers to bash on Sophie even more. We finally got Amy content this episode, and Amy was a character I was interested in coming into the season because she had this storyline set up in episode 1 about wanting to step out of Khan's shadow because he's obviously extremely well known on MasterChef. Sandra also gets that Sophie and the boys just tell her the plan, and she doesn't like it only for her to be a hypocrite by telling Amy the plan. That being said, I do like Sandra's strategy of convincing Amy that her idea is actually Amy's, resulting in her doing the dirty work for her, as when you're a two-time winner like Sandra, all you need to do is make it to the end of the game and people will reward you with the money, so she just needs to sit back and cause chaos without people knowing it's her pulling the strings. So Amy begins rallying the troops, which worried me considering this should be a very obvious non-elimination episode, and so it was more than likely blindsiding Sophie, Jordan, Ben and Croc in front of their loved ones, while Sophie more than likely was just going to the opposite tribe. And while the Sophie boot was heavily foreshadowed, and I figured she'd be going, I felt it made more sense as Jesse and Sam, the swings, to not make the move, and vote David considering he literally blew up on Sam last tribal. So they go to tribal with Jesse and Sam being established as swings between these two voting blocks, and the water tribe enter tribal to watch what happens. I find it extremely jarring that Jonathan just speaks to the tribe with no sense of privacy and immediately talks about David putting a target on his back last tribal. But after some pre-vote ramble, everyone goes to vote this time with the introduction of Champions vs Contenders 2 music in Spots and Stripes, another one of my favourite Survivor tracks. Sandra very evidently says something in the voting hut about Sophie but it seems they have cut it and only included her saying adios mate, then folding her card. Jesse also gets up to vote and writes down an S, which made the vote completely pointless because Sandra wasn't even built up as a this tribal, and David doesn't begin with an S, meaning we as a viewer know him and Sam are blindsiding Sophie. So Sophie is eliminated 7-4, to four, but it is announced to have been voted out of her tribe, but not out of the game, and joins the blue tribe, which was an extremely lazy way to do a non-elimination episode in my opinion. But so KJ and Sophie get to reunite on the water tribe. In episode 5, they bring up Alex's back problems in the preview, which hasn't been an issue since episode 1, making it obvious something is going to happen to Alex's back again. I also find it funny how, as per usual, they have text stating they respected the land of the Elders only for the next scene to include half a forest engulfed in flames. 
we finally get some KJ content outlining the Sufi situation. Sufi then gets this extremely villainous edit talking about controlling the water tribe, which is then complemented by the editor showing heavy rainstorm footage, creating this fun storm is coming storyline. We get a small check into the Blood Tribe, where despite being the target for two eliminations in a row, David gets no content this episode, and won't do for the next 12 episodes. I'm not even exaggerating. And even though they could have made David have some redemption arc, which he clearly has, they just ignore him from this point on, making him have no win equity whatsoever. Croc also makes a beeline for Sandra after being blindsided at the previous tribal and asks her for advice on what to do, which I felt was a good strategic move as this lets Sandra see him as someone very needy towards her and since he's coming to her after being blindsided, that also shows her he can be a potential ally. At the reward challenge, we get Sophie's debut on the Water Tribe, where she says the Blood Tribe should be worried of her because, oh, she can vote out all their loved ones, which was an insane comment to me, considering if the majority of the Water's loved ones voted her out, I doubt they'd act differently, and even on the show, Sam says something to this effect. That being said, as I touched on earlier, I feel the Sophie move was an awful move for Sam, as she voted her out knowing there'd be a non-elimination episode and caused distrust between herself and the three strongest men on the tribe, rather than just voting out David. Although the edit doesn't portray her as being in the wrong, and in fact, Due to Sophie's negativity, it can be argued that Edda portrayed her as being in the right and eliminating this extremely villainous person. Nonetheless, we get to the Sumo at the Sea reward challenge, where Jonathan again refers to Mark as King Kong, uh, so that's fun. We then get some fun matchups like Sophie versus Sam, where Sam beats her, and it's fun seeing Sandra compete in yet another challenge. The reward was a meal, however the tribes would be at the same camp, which felt like a very scripted twist to cause conflict between the person voted out just last episode and the rest of their tribe. And I felt really bad for individuals like Khan, who is crying over seeing Amy, and the edit just completely ignores him, as well as the fact David is the only one on this reward without a loved one to be with. We also get Sam somehow get a picture of their son with Mark, which is confusing to me as to how Sam got this, like did she smuggle it in? On the reward we have a funny moment from Ben saying Shay's been a vegan for 7 years, I turn around and she has a sausage in her mouth, which was great delivery, although again it's more content involving Shay that is told solely from Ben's perspective. We then get Sophie being able to chat to her old boys alliance and Jordan outlines the fact he doesn't want to be associated with Sophie anymore because that will put a target on his back. But Sophie really has an emotional outburst at Jordan which really comes off as unfair as what was she expecting him to do? Continue being in a minority of three while she was on another tribe? Again, considering this conversation is literal feet away from Sam. We get to the immunity challenge, which was probably the worst case situation for Alex on his back, where the tribe have to hold ropes attached to a heavy snake. Once the tribe member let go, they were out, therefore resulting in more weights being put on those that remain in. We've seen this challenge in several forms, with the drop out, the weight gets heavier ideology, and while cool, I prefer the likes of Brains vs Bronze Barrel Endurance Challenge, as he utilise more strategy. On the topic of Brains vs Bronze, we get the return of the Celsius meter, which is a nice touch to showcase to us, the viewer, how tough the conditions are. While this challenge does involve people holding on to a rope for as long as they can, Amy seems to pioneer a good strategy by letting her tribe know she was slipping, allowing them to brace in case she went. That being said, Ben puts in an insane shift by becoming the last person on his tribe and holding on to the weight designated for 10 people. Sophie and Alex are also the last two standing for the water tribe, which is extremely impressive considering Alex is back. But Ben pulls through and narrowly the water tribe are sent to tribal. The obvious boot this episode was Sophie, but we get a lot of content about taking out Khan with his idol, although it quickly becomes telling that it's only KJ pushing this blind side. That being said, and perhaps this was to bluff people into thinking he was playing the idol for himself, but Khan begins saying he might go home tonight. 
At Tribal, we have our usual round of questions when Jonathan begins the voting segment and asks Alex to vote, which the music immediately dies and Alex sits there for a few moments before saying he can't do it any longer because of his back. Despite being medically cleared, Alex still says his back is hurting him so much that he's struggling, which is a shame because if he hadn't pushed himself as hard as he did in the immunity challenge, he likely would have been okay. He even says as much that episodes 2-4 to four, he was feeling better. While this is sad, I do wonder why Alex waited until Tribal to announce he was considering quitting. It also comes clearly as a blindside to the rest of the tribe, as everyone is taken aback. This is then followed by Alex asking the tribe to vote him out and spare him, but Mark refuses, and I would have refused to vote him out in this situation here, as it would have been the perfect opportunity to vote out Sophie and burn Khan's idol. But despite everyone saying they refused to write down Alex's name, he instead just officially announces that he's quitting the game. I did find it to be salt in the wound from Jonathan to order him to also throw his buff in the fire as he exited, but with Alex quitting it makes a lot of sense why he was barely on the show. But there isn't much to talk about with Alex, he got very minimalistic content which only surrounded his injury in episode 1 and 5 where it was the most relevant. With that said, Alex also didn't seem like the most interesting of TV, although his tribe seemed to like him, so while I never think he could have won the game, he likely would have been destined for a long run. For the previously on segments leading into episode 6, we then get a lot of commentary on Khan being spared from having to use his idol at the previous tribal, or would have gotten voted out, which came out of left field a lot to me considering Sophie should have been the boot and spoilers, she ends up being the next boot. On the Blood Tribe we start right off the bat with Jesse content, although he only gets one confessional which is surprising considering he and Sam were swing votes the previous Blood Tribal. We then return to the Water Tribe where we get more military mark content but also Sophie content. And I do like her trying to work with Khan as he's someone she can bounce ideas off. The problem is Khan sees through it, leading to Sophie yet again being undermined. Back on the Blood Tribe, Sandra brings up her Day 16 curse, where on both Game Changers and Winners at War she gets eliminated. And while this was a perfectly fine confessional, this was taken far before Day 16 in the game, which makes it clear that the edit is setting her up at the very least to be going to Tribal when it hits Day 16 in game. While I've been praising Sandra, I do feel like she goes too gun ho on targeting David at this stage, where she even proceeds to scold him in front of the rest of the tribe, which isn't a great look. I was also surprised not to see Michelle still not given any content this episode, considering she was a part of so many important conversations. We also see Sandra talking about what Survivor has done for her, which was very sweet. She then identifies Amy, David and Jay as a trio, and wants to eliminate it with the help of the Alphas. While I like this move from Sandra, I feel she goes about it in the wrong way, by telling the three guys Amy wanted to split them up, but she wasn't going for Jordan because she said she liked him. This was bizarre to me, as she could have left it at Amy wanting to split up the three guys, as now she gives incentive to Jordan to go and tell Amy, someone who seems close to him, that Sandra is targeting her, and this somewhat happens later in the episode. This leads to Croc getting both strategic and personal content, again about him being a former rugby player, which felt more so like foreshadowing for what the reward challenge would entail. At the reward challenge, we get the announcement of Alex quitting the game, where Jay, his loved one, gets a moment to talk about him and his back. The challenge is rugby, but in the water. There were a few good moments in this challenge, like Mark and Croc again going after each other. Sam and Sandra also get a cute moment talking about how all SASs are redheads, and the inclusion of small scenes like these where the cast intermingle is fun for me as a viewer to see. It makes the characters feel that bit more alive. The Blue Tribe end up winning this challenge ultimately with some odd scenes like Chrissy feeding Jordy a pickle only to stuff her hand down her swimsuit immediately after, and Shay eating bacon despite what was shown on the show as vegan, but as later clarified she stopped being a vegan a little before coming out on Survivor. On the Blood Tribe we get more Amy content talking about the tribe losing the challenge. 
She also goes into the water with David and Jay, which causes Sandra to call the trio out once again to Sam and Michelle. However, Amy gets more content this time, talking about searching for an idol, manages to find it in the tree, and gets it with the assistance of her pole, resulting in her now having a hidden immunity idol. We get to the immunity challenge, which involves five people swimming out, climbing a net and grabbing a ball, then passing it to a tribe to shoot it into the net. However, you'll notice there was a second rack of balls available, making me think all ten were originally supposed to be out to collect their balls and then shoot their own shot, but the producer's last minute bailed out, which... Looking at how the challenge went was probably the right move. After Croc went up to do the challenge, you could clearly tell he was exhausted when returning to land and immediately fell on his back. Although medical do come in and assess the situation, he's cleared and continues in the game which is great to see. But because they lose, the Blood Tribe yet again have to go to Tribal Council. Sandra once again continues her crusade against David and tries to get the Alphas in on the plan to get him out. We then get Amy talking to Jay about being terrified that David will get voted out. She also gets a zombie confessional talking about how she knows Sandra is talking to the three Alpha males, so do with that what you will. The minority three then receive content trying to flip the three alpha meals on Sandra. Jay makes a pretty good pitch to Benny about Sandra being a big threat while bad in challenges and with Jay being on the chopping block due to being in the minority, I wondered how he hadn't got any confessionals at this stage in the game. Then Michelle, really out of nowhere, gets a fantastic confessional talking about learning from Sandra and also witnessing Amy finding the idol. And really this should have begun Michelle's storyline as if they were given a confessional or two every episode, I could have seen myself rooting for Michelle as a likeable underdog for the remainder of the game. But this is the only confessional she receives for the entirety of the pre-merge, which is insanity for the producers to do so, and therefore it feels like they needed to include this confessional to explain how the majority know about Amy's idol. Michelle tells Sandra, who then tells the Alpha Males the new plan, and Croc wants three on Amy, four on Jay, which is odd because wouldn't you want four on Amy in case she doesn't play the idol? Sandra then also wants people to scare Amy into playing her idol. Later in the episode, we then have Jordan telling Amy that she needs to play the idol on herself, which is presented from the edit as Jordan potentially flipping, but as I said, it was Sandra's plan for people to get Amy to play the idol on herself, and if Jordan was to flip, all he had needed to do is move his vote from Jay to Sandra, causing a 4-3-3 vote anyway. At Tribal, Amy plays her idol on herself, and in a pretty predictable manner, she blocks the first three votes. Sandra receives three, but Jay is eliminated with four votes, and Sandra lives to see another day. But what is there to say about Jay? He literally got zero confessionals this entire season. I believe this makes him now the second person in all of English-speaking Survivor to be eliminated without having confessional, and the first also happened in Australian Survivor. But the fourth season, which just goes to show how bad the editing of the show overall is. Again, this is now the second time this has happened. Probably the biggest issue I have with eliminating both Sam and Jay with zero confessionals is that they actually seem like fun and entertaining individuals. Like, people have said postseason in Champions vs Contenders 2 that Sam was a massive threat and Jay this season was making convincing arguments for Sandra to go and even fought back against Sophie when she was threatening to vote out their loved ones on the Water Tribe. Now, Jay wasn't as horrendously edited as Sam, in that he at least got screen time and was shown talking in certain scenes. Some people even said he got a voiceover line, which I personally haven't been able to find out. I also find it odd storytelling that Sandra has this craving for David to be voted out all episode, only for the split to be on Amy and Jay. Literally everyone in that alliance but David. In episode 7, we return to the Water Tribe with Nina finally coming back on our screens after having a few quiet episodes and she has this interesting confessional saying she can now make it to the end of the game which is rather upsetting considering what eventually happens to her. We get the walkouts from the tribe as they approach the next challenge where Jay is revealed to have been voted out. We get Sophie with a grin on her face saying she's happy to see certain faces which essentially means she's happy to see the Alpha 3 are still there. 
which I just find extremely ironic, considering two episodes ago she was bashing Jordan, one of these alphas, for supposedly abandoning her. This then leads to Jonathan, who announces they're swapping tribes. And I hated this. For me, I always find that when swaps happen during Blood vs. Water seasons, it makes the dynamics less interesting, as it gives a lot of incentive for people to just vote out those with loved ones in the game, resulting in every boot from this point forward, resulting in one half of the loved one duo being voted out. I would have found it more interesting to have a swap around the final 16, like in Champions vs. Contenders, so that we can get to see these individuals competing against their loved ones more and having to fend for themselves on their tribe. We get a few confessionals like Sam wanting to work with Mark and this being the opportunity for them to reunite as well as Nina not wanting to be with her mother Sandra because that would put a target on her back. Lo and behold Nina is on a try with her mother Sandra and Mark picks no buff. However, because of the uneven numbers, Jonathan gives Mark the option to pick which tribe to go to, leading to this dilemma for Mark. He could either go to the New Water tribe, which had his wife Sam, or the Blood tribe, which had his Old Water allies like Jordy, Josh and Nina. Eventually, he picks the latter and goes to the New Blood tribe, abandoning his wife Sam. You can clearly tell Sam is upset, and initially this move is painted as a negative for Mark, but we later get confessionals from Sam actually highlighting the good of Mark's plan. After all, if they were together, it would put a major target on their backs. We also get Jonathan talking to Josh about being with his cousin Jordan on the Blood Tribe, which was much needed because, again, I needed to remember who Jordan's loved one was, because they still give Josh no content, which is ridiculous considering what happens post-merge. We also get talk from Sandra and Nina where they're both brutally honest about Sandra apparently cramping Nina's style and Sandra lets it be known she got both at the previous tribal, which is always good for trying to keep your target down. The reward challenge consists of a tug of war but on boats and once again we see Mark's leadership fully highlighted as his commands of dedicated strokes rather than winging it seems to pay off. We get to the Water Tribe's new dynamics, as now Sam has to share a tribe with not only Sophie, but now KJ, her loved one. And again, Sophie is shown as being against Sam for previously blindsiding her. Just to reiterate, while the Sophie move wasn't the worst idea for Sam, it was an awful idea considering she of all people should have known this would have been a non-elimination episode. So, her feud with Sophie really bogs her down now that they're swapped together. Chrissy then goes advantage searching and comes across an idol, resulting in her, despite not ever seeing the show, having two idols in the span of seven episodes. Immediately she lacks Croc into the fact she found the idol and gives it to him. I also love Croc's confessional thereafter, where he quotes Sandra talking about idols in Don't Tell Soul, which comes up quite a lot this season. We also get Jordy content, and although he got small bits last episode and his intro package with Jesse in episode 1, this really starts his story as the biggest character. Due to them being swapped onto a tribe of Sandra, Jordy wants to take her out and is one of the first people to bring up her name. I also love the scene between Sandra and David where she tells him they now need to start over, which comes across as very transparent because she doesn't have the numbers on this new tribe. At the immunity challenge, we get some more fun content from Khan calling the tribal immunity Billy, his loved one, with Josh and Croc doing the initial hero portion of the challenge for their respective tribes. Josh quickly chops down the ropes, releasing the net, and climbs it up, where we then get one of the most cringely yet hilarious lines from Jonathan, saying, Pilot Josh, flying up the net. <laughs> Which is just amazing. We then get Sandra's challenge weakness highlighted on a few occasions, as even the editors splice Jonathan's commentary together to say Sandra being a real handbrake in this challenge, and while zombie confessionals like these are bad things for players to say because it shows the editors are just creating a fake narrative, as again, if something is actually happening, they could just use their actual confessionals. But when Jonathan says something clearly spiced together in post, that really worries me, as it's clear the editing team felt the need to dedicate their time to foreshadowing negativity towards Sandra. This results in the new Water Tribe winning immunity and sending the Blood Tribe to Tribal on day 16, where Sandra again refers to this as her unlucky day. Initially, even though Jordy brings up challenge weakness, the men on the tribe decide to target Mel, which came out of left field for me considering Mel 
bizarrely, to this point, never had any content. And this starts the tradition of male being targeted coming into a tribal, but never actually receiving content about it. We also get some Nina content talking about the challenge and further undermines Mel about her clumsiness which allows a small opportunity for Sandra to actually survive this tribal. Sandra attempts to go with what the Alliance is saying, however Jordy gets a lot of content talking about Mel being too easy of a vote and wanting Sandra out. He then highlights her challenge weakness and her threat level as big reasons to get her out. We also get Shay talking about her idol, which hadn't been referenced since episode 2, which made it clear something was going to happen with it. While the edit plays up the fact she could use it on Sandra, I never found that was going to be a realistic possibility, considering Shay was extremely worried about her threat level, and saving the Queen of Survivor would have been the antithesis of that. Coming into Tribal, I felt it was going to be an obvious Sandra boot, and this was further highlighted when she turns to look at Nina about the vote, and Nina looks away, which results in a writing on the wall moment where Sandra realises she's about to get voted out. We get a voting confessional from Jordy further showcasing him as the mastermind behind getting Sandra out and Nina writes down Sandra's name resulting in her being the second daughter to write down her mother's name. When Jonathan asks for an advantage to be played, Shea stands and plays her idol on herself. Although I get the idea of burning your advantage in front of others at a tribal where Sandra was so obviously being booted, I felt saving it for one more round would have offered her more viable protection on top of the ability to show her tribe she's burning the idol. The situation is very reminiscent of Shane in Champions vs Contenders where she burns her idol as Moana is obviously being voted out. I do like the music, Veil of Tears, as it creates a nice send off for someone as legendary as Sandra. And I know some people thought Sandra played amazing this season, while others think that she played horribly. Personally, I'm in the middle where I can appreciate her strategy of getting others like Amy to do her dirty work while she stays under the radar. I also like that she was willing to participate in a lot of the challenges and break the stigma of her being useless, which resulted in, at least for a while, the tribe considering Mel weaker than her. That being said, Sandra had very similar issues to her other games, such as having tunnel vision on one person, in this case David. She also can tend to act rather cocky while on the top, and we even see it on this season where she openly scolds David in front of the others. But I feel if Sandra returns for any other season of Survivor, this is the trajectory we should expect. She uses a shield on her initial tribe, and then gets voted out to her threat level on her swap tribe. That being said, I feel like she gets unfortunate with her new tribe, as it consists of the majority water, with the majority being meals, that really prioritise challenge performance. Although she was a big character this season, she gets almost twice as many confessionals as everyone else eliminated before her combined, which sums up the issue with Australian Survivor's editing. We begin with episode 8, back with Jordy, reaffirming his move to take out Sandra, and while his edit does die out over the next few episodes, he's at least given small bits of screen time that keep me interested in his winning prospects. We get a Khan's Kitchen segment, where he talks about cooking on the Water Tribe, which is fun considering his backstory of being a MasterChef contestant. That being said, it's at this point where Khan's edit begins devolving, where in earlier episodes he had a lot of strategic content, talking about working with Mark and his view on the tribe. Instead, from this point and on, the content he gets is about his idol and him being a MasterChef contestant, which definitely made me stop thinking of him as a winner. We also get Sophie being further undermined by the edit, where she tells Ben that she loves him only for him not to say it back, and when talking about who they think was voted out the last tribal, she says Jordan, when Jordan wasn't even a consideration for the vote. It's also a bad luck for her being so happy to see the Alpha 3 still intact after episode 6, when she's now assuming one of them got voted out. Sophie then also gets shown negatively by telling KJ how to play the game, which came off as really ironic considering she had already been voted out of her tribe. Throughout this negativity, I did like Sophie trying to re-establish bonds with Sam and referencing Matt Rogers and David in All-Stars as their game plan, which probably was her best attempt at getting Sam on her side. We get to the immunity challenge, which was a throwback to the 2017 edition, where the contestants had to place discs between their hands, and it was cool seeing Mark and Sam, contestants who previously did the challenge, trying to share their experience with the tribe. Mark correctly identifies that muscle is actually a negative in this challenge as the individual has to hold up their muscular arm and the disc. 
Very early on the blood tribe, Mel drops out, continuing the subplot of Mel sucking at everything, which would have been more entertaining if we actually knew who Mel was. Despite being criticised by Jonathan at the start, Chrissy lasts a surprising amount of time, however Blue eventually loses. I wish I could say this was a surprise, but we saw in the previews for the next episode where Sam explicitly states her and Sophie are going for each other tonight, which means they are going to Tribal Council. On the Water Tribe we get Sophie fighting to stay in the game, as obviously, due to the fact she was voted out once, she could very easily be voted out again. I was impressed by Sophie choosing the more strategic option and putting the votes on Khan rather than Sam, the more emotional option. We then get a vote split dilemma, causing Chrissy to become frazzled, which I find funny considering what happened with Kara in Brains vs Bronze just the season prior. The editors include this Sophie apparently finding an idol scene, which felt very forced, as if Sophie finds an idol this would have been explicitly shown to us and seemed like a desperate attempt to revive tension in the episode. At Tribal we get to the vote and I did feel bad for KJ, as you could tell she was visually upset. While Sophie voted for Khan, Croc and Michelle put two votes on KJ in case Sophie had an idol, but the remainder of the votes, including KJ, landed on Sophie and eliminated her from the game. And Sophie was obviously one of the biggest characters on this season, who had 32 confessionals in total. To put in perspective how many confessionals that is, the person who achieved 7th place this season got the exact same number of confessionals. She was a strong villain of the season, although unlike Jordy and even Josh, who are villains later on in the season, I felt that persona wasn't as forced as the other two, which is a positive. That being said, she did come off as bossy and borderline rude to some of the other contestants on the show. She also obviously doesn't look that great postseason. However, despite her social game lacking, I felt her strategy of aligning with the big guys and trying to work undercover with Sam were good moments of strategy. Again, although few and far between on this season, I felt her edit was satisfying for the character they made her out to be. In episode 9, we get some more lovely visual shots, juxtaposing the cool text font, saying day 19, which I find funny. We also get some more content from Khan talking about his idol, so whippy for that. Something I also find interesting is the survival element of the show is brought up as the contestants talk about the bites. While some people may say these scenes are only used to pad out the length of the show, I enjoy them and let's face it, I'd rather have survival scenes any day of the week over the same confessional used the 10th time. We also get Josh content. Finally, where we get his personal intro package into him being a pilot, and this really becomes his episode, causing me to wonder if Jordan was getting blindsided this episode, as the cousins got a surprising amount of content. This challenge looks like something ripped straight out of Takeshi's castle, with a massive inflatable where completing tribe members had to tug a pole to ram a member of the opposing tribe with. And this challenge was just extremely awkward to me, as you had people like Josh just standing there, being unable to do anything as he's being nudged in the arm by an inflatable. Jonathan also joins in the banter calling David by his name Juicy, which is a funny moment on the show, and adds that extra level of personality to the show and also JLP the host. That being said, you assume this is a one or two time joke, but Jonathan from this point forward begins addressing David as Juicy, to the point we could go entire episodes where Jonathan hasn't called the poor man by his name. The Blood Tribe eventually won the reward, which was in the form of fish and chips. I wondered if the producers were actually going to be as sadistic as they were in All Stars when they gave the tribe potatoes and fishing gear instead, but fortunately they actually got a meal. She outlines the morale boost this gives the tribe, and we see Jordy's trick, which involves eating a lemon, which I'm not sure if I'd call that a trick. Nonetheless, it was a fun transition from the plates with sauce where people ate fish and chips, contrasting Blue's rice. We then get Ben in this Holiday Sucks hat, which is a very fun hat which perfectly summarises Survivor. This immunity challenge is one we've seen in Ko Rong and Winners at War, where contestants have to cross a grate and stack objects to create a tar, although this time it is a team immunity challenge. I also find it interesting at the beginning the tribes kept the bigger guys to the middle or back stages, which although their height would have been important isn't a necessity until the very end game. If I were in charge of this challenge I would have gotten as many big guys to the start of the challenge because 
Due to their bigger feet and bigger bodies, they had more of a chance of colliding with the Great and knocking down the tower. We even see the difference in speed between Amy and Jordan at a section in this challenge. The Water Tribe wins immunity, which sends the Blood Tribe to trial once again, and like I expected, the loved ones in Josh and Jordan began to get targeted. Josh again is given even more confessionals, but this time he tries to relate this outlook on the game to his profession in being a pilot. Amy goes to Mark looking to get rid of Jordan to split up the boys, although she really seems to struggle getting the numbers together for this plan, as Mark has to help her in identifying Mel as an option. Amy then goes to Shay, asking her to vote Jordan, but is worried since Shay is supposedly super close with Josh. Where were we told about this important piece of information? And really throughout this entire season, it seems like the edit massively undercredits Josh, as there are many times his friendships with people are just sprung up on us, when it is absolutely necessary to mention. After being informed of the plan to split up Josh and Jordan, Shay immediately goes to Josh and informs him of the plan, which really killed any chances of Amy's plan working. At Tribal we get this intense last stand sort of music, as everyone goes up to vote, and although I thought a Josh and Jordan could have been viable boots this episode, Amy is eventually eliminated from the game, which did create some intrigue for me coming into the next episode, as it was very clear that Khan had a strong relationship with Amy. But Amy was a fun presence on the show in spite of her edit being filled with patches where she had no content. She was a strong strategic player that managed to pull off some moves, like the Sophie blindside, and her plan to take out Jordan was a good idea, but harmed by the fact Mark, Jordy, Josh, Jordan and David seemed to have control through their male alliance. While her storyline of trying to step out of Khan's shadow ultimately fails on this occasion due to Khan outlasting her, and in my opinion having more iconic moments, she's one of the more notable characters on this season, and someone I wouldn't mind seeing back on the show. In episode 10 we begin once again with Nina taking the time to break down the tribe's dynamics and identifies Josh as being a major threat which was interesting considering at this point in time Jordan had the better edit than Josh and despite getting a strong previous episode Josh gets neglected by the edit for the next few rounds despite again playing well. They could have easily given Josh a storyline working with his cousin and or talking about getting Amy out, but none of that happens. Perhaps the most egregious thing is despite not giving him proper content until episode 9, this season had everything going for it that allowed them to ignore Josh for the first 8 episodes as long as they edited him well for the rest of the season. They had Benji from Champions vs Contenders who didn't get content until around episode 9 and they ended up being a massive underdog in the game who could have won. We also just finished watching Survivor 41, where Erica is this massive surprise as a winner, considering she had very little content in her first few episodes. So the show had everything going for it to excuse her inability to edit Josh, as long as they gave him a clear story moving forward. But again, we get no Josh content whatsoever, which ruined his winning chances. After some confessionals talking about the tribe, we then get Nina's personal content talking about her job, and how nobody really took the time to get to know her. I mean, she really bashes on her job, which, I mean, she probably had to hand in her notice to go out and play Survivor anyway, but it isn't a great look if she's expecting to go back to her job after Survivor. But it was nice seeing Nina's personal content. Nina and Shay then also get strategic content, where really out of nowhere, Shay calls out Mark as being the merge boot unless he wins immunity, which felt like foreshadowing to me that Mark would be in hot water at the very least coming into the merge. We then get to David, Josh and Jordan already bringing up Shay as an option to boot for when they come to Tribal which was rather jarring considering this was so early in the episode. What's even more crazy is that once again we get Mel being thrown out as a person to vote out by Nina. Again considering we don't know who Mel is. She hasn't got a single confessional and this is her third time in a row now being brought up as the vote. But we get to the Water Tribe where we check in with Jesse. Bear in mind, over the course of the last 9 episodes, Jesse had 4 confessionals, whereas in this one episode, episode 10, he has 17. This is just ridiculous, and shows how lopsided the edits really are this season. Although, at least unlike Josh, Jesse gets a fairly consistent edit from this point forward, 
backed up by strategic content, particularly in this episode, where he highlights his relationship with Sam and the tribe hierarchy. He also has a strong narrative in being young and therefore underestimated in the game, which I felt would result in a massive payoff this season with more than likely him orchestrating a massive blindside. That doesn't quite work out. Sam also gets content talking about how big guys get booted at this stage of the game, which is blatant foreshadowing for the next three tribals. That being said, we return to Jesse, who suddenly just starts calling out Ben for his obnoxious behaviours, like Ben saying how he's going to win the game every day, and Ben scraping the bottom of the pan for rice so they can't have crispies in the morning. It all came out of left field, and considering Australian survivors bare bone edit style where they often bring up something at the last possible moment they can, this made me expect a Ben blindside in this episode. We get to the challenge where we get a clear zoom into the dead wood behind Jonathan. Perhaps nothing, but considering we know something happens to Nina in the challenge from the previous episode's preview, it could have been the editors foreshadowing her injury. We also see the trip the contestants have to go through to get to the challenge, which involves them walking down a hill in zigzags. It's really no wonder there have been several bandages and even an injury from Alex, as doing this while you're starving can't be easy. This challenge was another slip and slide, except it had a basketball end game where the tribes had to shoot some hoops. We get some notable moments like Josh is over the top relaxing on the way down, but then we get to Nina who they put a lot of focus on as she climbs up. Then as she falls into the water, she obviously hits her foot at an angle, causing her to be unable to walk, and while they dubbed over Jonathan's commentary, Jordy and Mark quickly identify she's hurt. It is really nice on this cast, seeing these individuals caring for one another, and it's very easy to get into the robotic, only strategy matters ideology. Mark even dives into the water to help her, which is sweet. Initially, Nina is assessed of the challenge and is given the thumbs up to stay in the game. This challenge continues and I do wonder if there are rules on this being a non-contact challenge because if it was, I'd be swatting balls out of people's hands faster than you can say Simon me. The Blood Tribe won a reward which had a really fun location as they were having this picnic with the set looking almost like someone's back garden. There were even seats to lounge on and a ball hitting game which Mel and Shay eventually go on. However, we get to a scene of Jordan, Jordy and Mark saying one of them has to find the advantage and if they find it, they'll let each other know. This is then humorously followed up by Mark finding the idol clue and celebrating he got it without anyone seeing which seemed off to me. The celebration seemed very rushed. This is then contrasted by Jordy, who reveals he saw Mark finding the idol clue, which was a well edited scene for the show, and really begins his rivalry with Jordy and Mark. Around this time I know people like Beelime saying they had Mark at the top of their winner rankings, and obviously they turn out to be correct, but because of this negativity from him, thinking he gets away with keeping the clue a secret, to foreshadowing, simply stating he will struggle at merge, I had him a bit lower down in my winner rankings at this point and coming into merge. We also get the doctors parting crashing because they need to check on Nina's foot again and re-examine it. This time they decide to take her away to say they can get a closer look at how bad her injuries are. This then leads to the immunity challenge where a car rolls up and out of nowhere it reveals Nina to be in crutches and while extremely sad this moment just felt so hammed up for the show. Once again, from a personal level, my hat goes off to Josh and in particular Mark, who instantly rushed to her aid. Nina then gets to stand on the mat and have a few inspirational things to say before being announced by Jonathan as being officially pulled from the game. And this is really where the season starts to go downhill in my opinion, as a lot of the better edited characters and Sandra, Sophie, Amy and Nina all go back to back. But let's talk about Nina, who was one of the most hyped of players pre-season and didn't disappoint. She showed a lot of game IQ and was able to build strong bonds with big names on this season like Shay, Mark and Josh. It's very evident that Sandra taught Nina well and with her being more physically gifted as well as the fact she doesn't hold grudges like Sandra could result in her being a better player for the long run. But we'll eventually see her back on Australian Survivor as Jonathan essentially confirms she'll be back, which was quite sweet to see. It's honestly a surprise Survivor US hasn't casted her yet because she was very entertaining on this season. Much like in All Stars with the Lee situation, we immediately get into the immunity challenge. 
And while I respect it's a show and they have to keep the game going, it feels very icky going from a really sad situation straight into a challenge. I love when Jonathan announces the challenge, Jordy gets extremely excited, while everyone else is still heartbroken for Nina. So Jonathan explains the immunity challenge, but announces surprisingly, there's an extra reward for the winning tribe. Oh, and it's a scroll. Oh, we love scrolls because that means it's another non-elimination episode. And this twist comes off as incredibly transparent because they very clearly need another non-elimination episode to color for Nina's medical evacuation. I also love how there's this really dramatic turmoil music playing as Jonathan reveals the note and they zoom into Mel slightly opening her mouth which came off as anticlimactic both to me the viewer but also the cast who were probably expecting a bigger twist. Like again, they zoomed into Mel to show a shocked expression. That's how desperate they were for someone to show shock. This challenge is similar to Kageyan's create a cart challenge where the tribe have to clear obstacles to get their chariot in a position where the shooters can firstly hit their monkey fist and then shoot down the targets with sandbags. Initially, I noticed some problems with the challenge, like Red and Blue having such close starting lanes, meaning they could have easily tossed hay bales onto each other's side, and the fact that everyone has to hold the chariot and carry it for a good length of time also means if one person gets too drained and lets go, then someone at the other end could have an entire chariot fall on top of them. Blood even needs to set down their chariot at one point to have a rest. Despite this, Blood wins immunity, causing water to go to tribal. Initially, we get content from Sam talking about needing to get Ben out, as both him and Shay are challenge beasts, and it's interesting that Ben is receiving some of the target through Shay being so physical. We also get Khan developing a fake story with Sam and a few others that they can tell Ben so he doesn't get suspicious, which involves Khan throwing his own name out so they can say they're burning his idol which seemed like a really poor strategic move and a risky one for Khan, who even seems to regret saying such a thing and clarifies with his tribe that they're not actually going to vote him out because of his idol. You also get Khan swinging his idol in confessionals and talking about how he's going to keep it because he doesn't want to play it, which makes sense for this trial considering everyone knows it's non-elimination. However, this confessional foreshadows events later in the game. Later in the day, we get Chrissy blowing up the majority's position by blurting out she heard Ben's name, causing him to become paranoid. Jesse then begins to get anxious as well, as he was beside Chrissy and fears Ben could start interrogating him. That said, Jesse plays off the situation very well by memorizing a split vote plan that wasn't even going to be enacted to keep Ben on his side. While the edit made it apparent Ben was the more likely boot, I did expect Khan to get voted out here. The only way I expected Ben to be eliminated at this tribal was because of Khan playing his idol and idling Ben out. Again, the player should have known this was a non-elimination episode round, and so voting out Khan, someone who has no loved one still in the game, burns less bridges than Ben, one of the strongest players in the game, who you don't want to let know is being targeted. This was the perfect opportunity for the tribe to actually get something out of this episode and burn Khan's idol rather than voting out Ben for him to be saved by some twist. Even KJ says it herself that they should be sending Khan out with an idol in his pocket. Although she doesn't have the best footing on the tribe and even identifies Jesse as leading the charge. A tribal Jonathan announces to the water tribe that the twist is that the blood tribe can sit in on their tribal. But of course, after seven seasons of the show, there's more to it than that. I was worried for a small while that this tribal we would see Jesse getting idled out by Khan playing his idol on himself, only for Croc to play his idol on Ben with the remainder knocking out Jesse because he got so much screen time this episode. After the votes are cast and nobody plays an idol, we get to the vote reveal where KJ gets one vote, Khan gets two, and Ben gets the remaining five. I like how they organised the votes as well, so us the viewer thought Cam would be getting the boot. Ben also gets to shoot off a passive aggressive thanks auntie comment to Chrissy, while we also see KJ saying she knows it's her at the foot reveal, which is odd considering she only gets one vote. So Ben receives a majority of the votes, but then the twist comes into play where the blood tribe gets to pick someone from the water tribe to be eliminated, but they had to have at least one vote cast against them which I actually don't mind as a twist. My issue with Sophie's non-elimination episode is that it was the bare minimum they could do as a twist, 
but this is quite a creative twist. It essentially allows for the Blood Tribe to pick the target of the majority or the minority, ensuring no matter what they're shaking up the dynamics of the tribe while having some freedom of choice. Their options were Ben, Khan, and KJ. I also find the Red Tribe being able to speak as jarring as even the Blue Tribe are being interviewed after the votes. We have the Red Tribe whispering. Jonathan then asks Khan why he's getting votes, to which Khan responds, Well, I have an idol that needs to be flushed, which is Threat Management 101, of course, in Survivor, reminding literally everyone you have an idol. Initially, I thought the Blood Tribe would pick Ben to take because of his challenge prowess. However, it seemed the game was very united against Ben and Shay at this stage and recognised they needed to be split up before a merge. While Shay advocates for Ben and even votes for him, everyone else picks KJ, resulting in her swapping to the Blood Tribe. In episode 11, we get the reactions from everyone from the last tribal, and I was surprised to see Ben being such a good sport, as a lot of the alpha males in his archetype usually would start screaming. However, this shows Ben has a deeper understanding of the game. On the Blood Tribe, we get content from KJ talking about her being on this new tribe. Her and Jordy have a genuine conversation about her being safe on the Blood Tribe too. She then identifies the boys as having the power on the tribe and says about how these boys need a female president. And this, plus her talking about how fit the boys are, really comes off as... Sus? Uh, I think that's the word. Shay then also gets to talk about how bringing over KJ was good for her because if they brought over Ben, then both of them would be seen as a par duo, which seemed hypocritical, considering she not only voted for Ben to join their tribe, but advocated for it. The immunity challenge is like the one in Game Changers, where with a paddle, tribe members have to navigate a ball through a maze, except each person has one small section they have to go through before they pass it off to the next person. Jesse also mouths the words throw in this challenge, which, although inferred leading up to this challenge, is explicitly shown to us as the viewer. Again, it just seemed like a terrible idea for them to go for Ben last tribal, as with the merge looming, the water tribe seem really desperate to get rid of him. It's also clear they used this challenge without adjusting for the numbers with Nina being gone, as the person who released the first ball then awkwardly had to run to the last maze and do it. Jonathan also references Mark's military precision, you know, for balancing balls on a paddle, what every military man does. They also show a lot of angry Ben scenes, which juxtaposes him earlier in the episode trying to be calm and relaxed. Ultimately, Jesse gets his way and the Water Tribe loses the challenge, resulting in them having to go to Tribal again. I did feel bad for Ben after this challenge, who is pleading with his tribe not to vote him out again. As we get back to camp, it's very apparent that through successfully throwing the challenge, that the tribe intended to vote out Ben immediately. However, Croc has other ideas. He tries to rope in Michelle and Ben to vote out Jesse, but Chrissy has an issue with this. This creates a really interesting dynamic that we haven't seen in a Blood vs. Water season before where a pair of Croc and Chrissy are actively trying to avoid working with each other as Chrissy really wants to work with Jesse and Croc wants him out. We also get a fun confessional from Chrissy saying she's basically adopted Jesse, which continues the fun subplot of Chrissy adopting every young man on a tribe with her. And while Ben and Jesse were being argued about, it's weird to me that Khan, with his idol, still wasn't brought up. But Croc tries his best to enact a plan to save Ben, to which Ben takes his information and tells Jesse that Croc is blindsiding him, which seemed to stem from his hatred from Chrissy, as well as Croc knowing about his blindsided previous tribal and not telling him about it. While this is an awful play from Ben as he's outing the one person trying to save him just to work with the people that blindsided him last tribal resulting in him being on the bottom of the tribe, he still also approaches the situation poorly from a social standpoint. He passes the information on to Jesse like he's rubbing it in his face with sucks doesn't it as his ending comment. And this play just comes off as very emotional by Ben, as he's clearly losing his closest ally and best shield. 
a tribal, they give Jonathan the episode title. <laughs> so that's something. Chrissy then announces she's voting with her heart and openly saying she's playing differently to others, which makes it readily apparent that she's not voting for Jesse. As everyone finishes voting, Jonathan asks if anyone has an idol and nobody stands, causing Croc, with an idol in his pocket, to be eliminated from the game. Chrissy yet again votes for Ben, and this causes Jonathan to announce Ben yet again as a wounded animal. So this felt like a rather unceremonious exit for Croc, who I was expecting to be a big player in this game. But he was largely neglected by the edit, and despite playing decently, he was in the minority on several occasions. While he was overall underwhelming, he has played better in comparison to other former sporting stars on the show, so at least that's something. That being said, if he plays more aggressive and is giving a second chance, then I could see him making a deep run. We begin episode 12 with Croc imagery, which is ironic considering Croc was just voted out. Immediately we begin with Chrissy being upset at Croc's blind side and wanting to enact revenge on Ben. On Blood, we get a fun Geordie Mark dynamic, where Mark again believes he's the only one to know about his idol clue, but Geordie still knows about his clue. Mark ventures away from the camp and finds the Blood idol. It is cool seeing him be so giddy, as he even references he's been waiting two seasons to finally get the idol. Eventually, however, Geordie addresses to Mark that he witnessed him obtaining the clue, and I do find it interesting he told Mark he knew about it, rather than using this information to blow up Mark's spot. Mark then also makes a poor play, in my opinion, by pretending not to have found the idol, and leading Geordie on a wild goose chase as he pretends to also look for the idol. Eventually, after wondering why they haven't found the idol yet, Mark reveals to Geordie he found the idol. Again, like the can situation in episode 3, I thought this would come back to bite Mark, as if I were Geordie and you refused to tell me about the clue, then led me on a goose chase for an idol you already had, I would have been suspicious of you, but Geordie doesn't seem to be initially. We get to the immunity challenge involving what I like to call the rolling pin and ball challenge, but instead of tribal immunity, each tribe will be going to tribal and winning individual immunity. Jonathan then also says two people will be voted out, which unlike Jeff who uses these twists in older seasons like the non-merge in Thailand, he never actually says the word merge. Jonathan specifically says two people will be voted out, which obviously doesn't happen. Two people are voted into a fire making challenge. And to be honest, that should have been expected, as Australian Survivor are never going to be eliminating two people at one tribal, and the last time this twist was used, in All Stars, Phoebe and Lydia go to fire. We again get some fun comments in this challenge, like Chrissy and Ben being very passive aggressive, talking about Croc's blind side. Can and Sam try to talk about Can dropping, where Can surprisingly agrees to giving Sam immunity, but won't drop until about an hour in because he wants to prove to himself he can be a challenge beast. After a while, Sam is in a lot of pain, to the point she seems unable to move her legs, and Jonathan has to help her down. After being lifted down by Jonathan and comforted by Mark, we skip a little ahead in the challenge to where Jessie is beside her, and Sam seems rather pale. This then leads to her passing out, where the medical team is called, and it was quite cute seeing Mark come over and say Sam has low blood sugar levels. Eventually Sam comes around and Khan is awarded immunity, with Shay being given immunity on the Blood Tribe. This creates a situation for Khan where he can either keep the immunity, more than likely guaranteeing him merge, or give it to Sam in spite of the fact she dropped before him. We get to the Blood Tribe, where the males seem once again in the par position, where the vote for them comes down to KJ or Mel. Mel, who hasn't got any confessionals and has been targeted for four tribals in a row. 
Ultimately, Jordy makes a great point in that Mel has a loved one on the other side in comparison to KJ who lost Sophie, meaning Mel can be more dangerous when they merge. We then get told by KJ how much of an issue Shay winning immunity caused as it did seem like they were ready to vote her out this tribal with the expectation the other tribe would vote out Ben. But now KJ shows real concern with getting eliminated to this tribal council. We also get Shay not wanting to be told what to do and trying to flip Mark to vote KJ. And all throughout this episode we get a lot of scenes where Mark is randomly the swing vote even though it seems very apparent that he's not. Back on the Water Tribe we have far smaller numbers as only 6 remain. Because he got his way last tribal, Ben tries to use his position on the tribe to put 2 votes on Khan and 2 votes on Chrissy with the attempt to play around an idol from Khan. We also get Ben talking about having a strong relationship with Michelle really out of nowhere which had me worried for his prospects of getting through this tribal. We then have the deal with Khan and while Sam makes some very cutthroat moves later in the game, voting him out after giving up his immunity necklace would have been a horrendous look in front of all the other players in the game. We get to tribal where Sam walks in with immunity and Shay keeps her necklace. I also find a really funny moment in this tribal where KJ says how Mark is a very special person to her where the editors then cut to Sam with a shock sound effect. The dynamics on the water tribe quickly become live as Ben stands up to talk to Khan eventually revealing to him that he needs to play his idol. And this is probably because Ben assumes the split vote plan is still going on, allowing him to burn Khan's idol while getting his adversary and Chrissy eliminated. Also at this tribal we get this weird moment where Khan suddenly gets this extremely over the top positive praise with heroic music playing in the background. Chrissy refers to him as a genuine good bloke. Cam begins crying and even everyone is patting him on the back. After everyone votes, Jonathan reveals another twist and that they had to disregard what he said before about actually voting two people out, but instead these two people would be competing in a fire making competition, which was very predictable. So the Blood Tribe eliminates Mel, while the Water Tribe yet again eliminates Ben and the two have to go to fire. Mel quickly gets her fire and is assisted by her sister Michelle as she does so. After struggling to keep it alight, Mel's fire begins to die out as Ben's fire goes big and strong but the wind blows it in the wrong direction of the rope. Because of this we end up in a situation where Ben and Mel are guarding the fire with their bodies and this strength of wind isn't something we've seen in a fire making challenge before. Mel, however, beats out Ben, resulting in her winning the challenge after getting voted out of her tribe, again, with zero confessionals. And it's ludicrous to me that we almost had another player eliminated this season with zero confessionals. On his way out, Ben hands Shay his hat, which is cute, and gets his torch snuffed. And Ben was Ben. Like Croc, he never seemed to have a solid footing in the game and was blindsided on many occasions. The play to get out Croc, someone trying to save him, was still crazy as sure Croc may have not told you about your blindside, but neither did Jesse who actually voted for you. I do find it odd as well how they explained essentially all of the Shay Ben duo from his perspective rather than splitting it up or telling it from Shay's perspective considering she lasts considerably longer. While he did have some small moments of fun on the season there's nothing that stands out to me about him and he's probably one of the more forgettable pre-merge boots. We begin episode 13 recapping what Jonathan calls an epic tribal council, you know that epic tribal council featuring a person with zero screen time and the other already being eliminated from the game, blocking wind with their bodies, how cool. They also take the opportunity to recap Mark and Khan's idols which very heavily hinted towards them being part of the upcoming storyline. 
we check in with Jordy on the Blood Tribe, where he has this interesting confessional, stating when your loved one goes home, your whole game changes. Combined with him saying, I can't wait to see Jesse, seeming to forewarn that he and Jesse wouldn't do so well when Merge hit. But finally, we get a male confessional after 26 days. So at least I can be happy about that. We also get this extremely a cringy voiceover by Jonathan, breaking down the fact there are four duos and five singles, and wondering if that will make them targets. Do the loved ones stay together? What will the singles do? Nonetheless, we get into the reward challenge, which involves the participants having to make a pyramid on a wobbly board. Jonathan then announces the reward as this odd gift from Set for Life for $5,000 each month for 12 months, resulting in $60,000, which seemed like a reward so far removed from usual survivor rewards where usually the contestants are usually competing for food or the odd car. Tangible items. Instead, this time they're playing for monthly installments of money, and a lot of it as well when you consider the placement prize money overall. But Khan dominates this challenge and eventually wins the money, and I do find it funny that out of all the people to win the money, it's the celebrity. The fact he also goes 2 for 2 in immunity challenges raises his threat level even more in the game, so overall on a strategic level, him winning this was not good for his game. We then get the merge feast after this challenge, which then leads to Mel talking about her and her sister Michelle. So essentially they're getting their intro package more than halfway into the season, but at least they outline how they're mirror twins. We then get Jordy revealing to Jesse that Mark has the idol, which begins the merge tension between those two. On the topic of Mark, we finally get to see him and Sam. Seeing them merge together was a great sight, and it felt very full circle for their arc, considering when they were back in 2017, they were voted out back to back. Sam also gets to break down their backstory of having a young son once again, which was sweet. Sam then brings up to Mark about Khan's idol as the two assess his threat level, and I like how Sam states she saw him looking for an idol, which causes Mark to say half a dozen times that if you're searching you'll need a clue, which was him obviously flirting with the idea of telling Sam about his idol. But he doesn't, and this causes Jordi, in a conversation with Sam, to leak to her about Mark having an idol. Jordi overall plays this situation off quite well, as Sam clearly didn't know about his idol, and guilt trips her by saying he shouldn't have told her, while simultaneously blaming Mark by saying he can't believe her husband didn't tell her. This causes Sam to circle back to Mark, who really comes off as robotic in this exchange. By saying he didn't want to tell anyone because there would be less chance of someone leaking it. But Sam is, you know, his wife. We also get the name Lava Pact as the Merge Tribe. And I'm currently having an internal conflict over if that is the stupidest tribe name in this franchise or if the Fire Tribe is. And once they decide the name, everyone, for some reason, puts their hands on Sam's head to yell lava. Mark again has this really robotic moment where Khan said he's worried about being targeted, only for Mark to say, you're a threat, they'll eventually come. Which, considering he votes for Khan later in the episode, seemed like such a poor way to conceal he was onto him. We get to the immunity challenge, which is a variation of when it rains it pours, which is ironic considering the time this episode was released, just before I released my guide to win, when it rains it pours video. But Jonathan runs through the challenge like how each person is holding up 35% of their weight, and even identifies that a high power to low weight ratio would be useful, which he then adds, like Shay, which seemed like such an unnecessary comment, and Shay even calls him out on the show to stop putting a target on her back. 
And this is an issue with Jonathan that persists through the season, wherein he randomly says things that needlessly put targets on people. We also get a lot of emphasis on Mark as he drops, which I find interesting. Then, although obviously voiced over post-show, Jonathan says Shay looking down the line and seeing who she needs to beat. And although he's at least not calling her out in front of the others this way, the fact Shay is again being called out for a challenge prowess seemed over the top. Then, we have all this built up for Shay to drop out before the final two, making her out as a challenge beast rather anticlimactic. We then get some insight into Mark's strategy coming into the next vote, where he and Jordy talk about voting out Khan. KJ also eventually drops out, which is interesting considering she got a lot of content in this challenge, outlining she was doing it for her children. In spite of this, Jesse wins immunity. We return to camp where we get more conflict between Sam and Mark because they want different people out. Sam explains how she wants Shay out due to her challenge performance, although Mark says he wants Khan out because he's a threat with the idol. However, the issue is, Khan and Sam formed a very strong bond where he literally gave his immunity necklace up for her. While Mark trying to burn the idol makes sense, it's at least portrayed in the edit that Sam is more so in the right as Shay won the last immunity challenge, was hyped up for this immunity challenge, and even goes on to win the next immunity challenge, which made me keep her in the number one spot rather than Mark. However, I personally agree with Mark's thinking more, as Burning Can's idol should be the priority here, although I'm surprised him and Sam don't find a compromise where they try to put the majority of the votes on Khan, burning his idol, and then put the remainder on Shay. However, the plan seems to be set on Khan with a split on Mel to break up a duo in case Khan plays his idol. Sam still isn't convinced throughout this conversation though. Enter Khan, who joins them only to realize they're arguing and asks, do I actually need to leave? Like, are you guys actually having a domestic? Which was always a funny line to me. I also find it funny going forward that Khan tries to be a mediator by getting Sam to discuss her emotions and then getting Mark to explain all while he's the reason they're arguing. Sam then completely spills the information to Jesse about how she wants to vote out Shay, but Mark wants Khan out. We enter Tribal, and as much as I bash on Jonathan for being completely unaware about the things he says, he asks Sam how her relationship is with Mark, which I find to be a really cute double-sided question, where the tribe assumes he's asking Sam that because she's merged with Mark, although we as the viewer know it's because they had a roller coaster of a day arguing. We also get some interesting scenes where Mark and Sam are almost trying to out psychology each other by convincing each other in roundabout ways that they should be voting the other way. They all go up to vote with some fun tribal music and then Jonathan asks if someone has an idol to play. As per usual, Khan refuses to play as idol, but he isn't spared this time as Mark gets his way and eliminates Khan, which really boosted his winning chances for me. Jonathan also has this weird moment where he tuts and says, Can, 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 which comes off as rather demeaning. But it's also weird, and with KJ opening her mouth, I was wondering if Jonathan was about to reveal a twist, like around this part of the game in Brains vs Brawn, but no, Khan gets his torch snuffed. And I really enjoy Khan. He was a fantastic presence, and really an archetype we haven't seen on Survivor Australia before. What I liked most about Khan was he was a celebrity with respect for the game, unlike Simon, Steve and Gavin, and could have ended up playing strong games like Matt, David or Lee had he kept his threat level lower. Again, he should have played as idol this tribal, and had he played it successfully, he could have shaken up the game, but him being so complacent with it, while foolishly reminding people he still had it, seemed to cause major issues. 
It goes without saying, however, I'd love to see Cam return, as he was so much fun this season. And his Ponderosa content in particular is very funny to me, where he calls everything a vibe. Episode 14's preview outlines the Mark and Sam relationship in detail once again, making it even more obvious these two were the frontrunners of the season. Sam then gets to talk about her lack of agency in the game, which I found ironic considering she took it upon herself to agree to Mark's plan and work with the boys. This is then followed up by Mark getting a full confessional to detail the cam blind side and they even subtitle Josh telling Mark you're locked into the end now really, which hits the nail on the head with what happens. They also show David on the show, pulling him out of the purple, the state how Sam didn't have any control at the previous tribal. To further exemplify this, Sam states she wanted Shay out last round, which isn't a great look to David and Jordy. After Sam gets dunked on more in the edit as Josh and Jesse talk about her being paranoid, Jordy takes Josh off for a one-on-one -on -one chat, where he announces to him that Mark has the idol, which initially seems to win over Josh, as he recalls Mark having opportunities to tell him and Jordan. We get to this challenge next, that looks really exhausting, where each person has to fill a bucket of water to hold down a table, so that they can build a puzzle for immunity. Despite a strong effort by all, Shay wins the immunity challenge, which helps validate Sam's concerns about her physicality from the previous episode, as once again she can't be voted for. We get a lot of Josh content back at camp, where he comes off as rather obnoxious, such as letting the girls pick between the two people he wants to vote off, and even tells Michelle she's copping votes. Because of this, the two twins and Mel and Michelle attempt to flip the vote around on him. Firstly, Mel approaches Mark and tries to get him to flip, with a confessional from Mel talking about how Josh is absolutely the leader, which is weird because we've had no build up to this storyline. Josh didn't even get content last episode, and now suddenly we're supposed to believe he's the king of the tribe. We then get Mel and Michelle trying to pitch to the girls that they need to stick together, otherwise the boys will pick them off one by one, and we get a lot of insight from Sam on this, about how she recognises all the women going is bad for her, and her picking off the females goes against every fibre of her being. At Tribal, we get the reveal of Khan, where everyone explodes in joy, with even Mark giving two thumbs and saying, you look good mate, in perhaps the most heterosexual way he could. But it was very sweet seeing everyone react so passionately for Khan. We get more content from Jonathan, poorly structuring his questions, as he asks Mel and Michelle how they aren't threats, only to immediately ask Josh how they are threats. And if I was in Josh's situation, I'd be livid at JLP because he's making it obvious where the lines are. While the tribals are a bit longer than US Survivor, this one really breaks the straw on the camel's back, where it's 15 minutes long and not much of note actually happens. I suspect this is the case because the boot was very obvious at camp, but after everyone votes, the final reading is one on Josh, one on Jordy, four on Michelle, but Mel is eliminated with the remainder of the votes, and although the editing team tried to play this up as a really sad moment with dramatic music playing, these two twins were edited so abysmally that I just don't care. And so we have Mel, who had no confessionals until Merge, which is insanity, considering she was targeted on so many occasions, and even beat Ben in fire. Now, to be fair to the editors, she didn't seem that interesting on TV, but they still could have given her something, so that we actually knew who she was pre-Merge. I don't have anything else to say. Episode 15 begins with Sam and Chrissy doing some makeup on each other, which is presented as a funny moment, and I love the contrast between that and Michelle obviously missing her sister. Michelle then recalls back to the last tribal where Mel correctly called out Josh as a strategic threat, and even Josh himself gets content talking about himself as a strategic threat while outlining the committee. 
However, everything is in Kumbaya as Josh, through a zombie confessional, says Jordy came to him about Mark's idol. This leads to Josh telling Mark, Sam, Chrissy and David that Jordy told him about the idol Mark found, which apparently burned bridges. Which, and I don't say this often, I just find stupid. Like, how does an individual telling you about a threat in the game, having an idol you don't even know about, constitute as being untrustworthy and burning bridges with you? If anything, that makes Jordy very trustworthy as he's telling you information. But then we get to Jesse and Sam talking where Jordy and Sam want to blindside Josh because again he's a massive threat in the game with Sam even saying Josh has played the biggest game and Josh knows it too. This leads to the reward challenge where in twos the groups have to get blocks from a hollow block with wire and then stack it on a rotating disc. I do like Australian Survivor setting out rules where the person can predict who they think is going to win, meaning David can still get the reward rather than having no chance at having it because he's unlucky. Eventually, Jordy and Chrissy win the KFC reward and I find Chrissy's reaction very fun. To share the love, they pick Mark, Jesse and Josh as their three picks for who will accompany them on the reward. And while the first two make sense from Jordy's point of view, you can clearly tell Josh was picked because Chrissy said so. On this challenge, they enjoy KFC and lounge. However, Jordy lifts a towel and finds an idle clue, but with the others coming along, he's forced to keep it hidden. Then, through some incredible work on Jesse's end by not flinching, Jordy is able to secretly stuff the idle clue down his pants, ensuring the duo keep their idle clue as a secret. I did find it risky though that Jesse takes the opportunity to openly move his idle clue from the back of his pants to the front, and although it probably prevents it from slipping out, it looked way too risky of a manoeuvre to be worth the reward. So when they come back from reward, we get the zombie line from Sam saying she was suspicious about Jordy and Jesse having an idol clue. This is later reaffirmed by Mark as he sits down with Jordy and brings up his military experience in being able to spot a liar. And after looking at Jordy's eyes, he's able to determine him as having something, which is impressive. Mark then takes Sam by the hand for a walk and Sam informs Mark that both the brothers have begun walking off, raising their suspicion levels even more, although even without the idle clue it seemed like they were targeting the brothers over Josh and Jordan anyway just due to the fact Josh leaked the info Jordy gave to him. This challenge was another endurance challenge, but this time featured hand-eye coordination as the main objective, where the players had to keep their ball on a block, and if it rolled off too much, they lost the challenge. Jonathan it takes this opportunity to call out Jordy for seeming not to have the patience nor composure necessary to win the challenge, which is ironic considering the end result. Ultimately, I felt really bad for the contestants that lasted a lot of time in the challenge, as holding onto a rope for such a long amount of time would hurt, and Jesse literally has to pull the fingers off one hand, off the rope with the other hand. But ultimately, Jordy this time wins immunity, and what I find bizarre is once Jonathan gives Jordy immunity, he says to Jordy it now makes his brother Jesse vulnerable, which would be setting off alarm bells for me if I was in Jordy's shoes. We get back to camp where once again Jordy and Jesse are rallying the troops to get Josh out, and again, I hate how much talk there is about Josh being this big move, considering we barely know who he is. Mark then takes the information from Jesse and Jordy that they're talking to Josh. Obviously, they would have gone for Jordy in this situation, but with the individual immunity, they load up on Jesse. This then leads to another Mark and Sam scene where he informs her they're voting for Jesse, which causes Sam to be obviously hesitant as she's been working with Jesse for the entire game. 
She even talks about how this vote is difficult for her to Mark, but Mark instead comes off as extremely dismissive in this conversation by saying it's decided, there's not much you can do, and it's an easy vote, let's go. Which felt a bit icky. In spite of Jesse being the main target for the tribe, he goes out searching for the idol and finds it. I also find it cool that, presumably because they have a bigger area to work with, idol clues still, even modern day, are used to find idols. So Jesse begins raiding the parchment for the idol, but then Sam arrives, busting him with the idol in hand, and you can tell Sam is terrified about what to do now that Jesse could be safe this tribal. She even looks at the cameraman or woman a few times, which I find hilarious. So typically in this situation where a target has an idol you know about, you'd split the vote, but Sam makes an incredible move by convincing Jesse his idol is sticking out of his shorts and that he should hand it over to her so she can fit it behind her towel. At this point in the game, Jesse had no reason to doubt Sam and so give it to her. Now I have talked about this move in my Australian Survivor Most Ingenious Move series, so go over there for a detailed analysis on why this move is so great, but this is probably the best move Australian Survivor has ever seen. Like we've seen someone convince a person to give them their idol, and this move really sets the entire season from this point forth as the story and overall conflict is built on this move. So we get into tribal on the cliffhanger if Sam will keep her word and work with Jesse returning his idol to him after the round or go with Mark and Josh. David is the first one up to vote and I find it rather odd that they gave him a voting confessional in the booth considering they hadn't given him any confessionals for 10 episodes at this stage. We also get Sam going up to vote, and although we knew she was likely voting for Jesse, we're shown her writing down his name as she says thanks for the idol, which always will be an iconic voting confessional for the franchise. So Jonathan collects the votes and then reads them aloud, to which Jesse is eliminated, and I love Jordy's reaction to his blind side. We then get an interesting moment we haven't seen before from a person voted out, as Jesse essentially threatens to blow up Sam's game and reveal the idol after she reveals she was in on the plan. But Sam says she's going to talk with Jordy after this round, which seems to prevent Jesse from blowing up her game. Jesse instead settles for a compromise where he tells Jordy he gave Sam the idol and leaves it at that, which really affects the course of the game as if Jesse revealed as he was getting his torch enough that Sam had his idol, then people would have been far more likely to believe Jordy. But Jesse was fun and I was actually rather impressed with him. Teens or people in their early 20s often struggle with coming off as strategic and getting the respect from their peers. But Jesse did great. For many parts of the game he was in a swing position and him plus Sam really seemed to be the decision makers on the Blood Tribe. The issue with Jesse from a legacy standpoint is firstly he does get overshadowed by his brother in the long run who has the more memorable game and on the topic of memorability I feel like Jesse will only be remembered as the kid that gave Sam his idol. Him likely only being remembered for that moment does suck for him though, as again he had a lot of great moments on the show showcasing his knowledge of the game. We begin episode 16, which really begins the downward spiral for this season, as although I tried to keep optimistic about this season, this back third was largely unenjoyable for me to watch. The Jesse blindside seems like the highlight of the season in retrospect, as from this episode and onward every elimination is very obvious, and the couple blindsides that we do get are only caused because of twists. But we head into this episode directly after Tribal, where despite losing his brother, Jordy is taking it well and saying it's part of the game, which is good to see. We then get to see Jordy and Sam discussing Jesse's vote, and how Jesse's idol can be a tool they can both use, which Jordy really didn't seem to buy, and he even identifies Sam and Mark working with Josh and Jordan. After we get more general content from Jordy talking about his position in the game and begins talking about Josh, 
While I can understand Josh potentially being upset at Jordy for trying to blindside him in this tribal, I find his social play in this situation rather poor. As Jordy says, I know I'm probably next to go, so it's with Josh cutting him off, saying, It's not us pissing in your pocket. We then get further idle talk from Sam, as now both her and her husband Mark now have idols which further stagnates the season as with them holding on to their idols new idols aren't dispersed into the environment then for as far as i've been counting the third time sam quotes sandra's if you have an idol don't tell anyone quote which at least in regards to mark's idol actually does more harm than good as advice and while sam talks about having power this is off the back of blindsiding two of her closest allies over the course of three tribals in Can and Jesse. We then get Jordy essentially reaffirming that he's drawing dead in the water and it's immunity or go home. Really this entire episode is ridiculous as while people may think I'm being over the top about the editing, we're 16 episodes in at the final 10 and four people this episode get confessionals. They include Jordy, Sam, Mark, and then two from David. And that's it. The immunity challenge is another endurance challenge where the contestants have to place their feet on small pegs and hold on to two posts surrounded in these gears. During this challenge, really out of nowhere, she begins pushing the idea of her, KJ and Jordy being on the bottom, which again relates to the editing, as she could have easily got a storyline this episode talking about building this minority alliance, but instead we get nothing from her. Jonathan, as per usual, announces the challenge is not made for big boys like Mark, but instead, this challenge is designed for people like Sam to win, which is rather strange to me that he is essentially placing bets during these challenges on who he thinks will win. He also brings up a line asking Jordy if he's in hell, heaven or purgatory, which again, he has these not so amazing hosting moments, and then phenomenal multi-layer comments like these that hint towards the purgatory twist later in the episode. After 70 minutes, it comes down to Shay versus Jordy, where you could tell the colour was going from her face. Again, I have to commend Josh for helping Chrissy down, and Jordan eventually helped Shay down, which was a big deal considering she falls limp seconds later, and medical needs to be called. But fortunately for Shay, uh, she quickly recovers. Jordy, however, won the challenge, resulting in him getting immunity once again. With immunity, Jordy once again goes back into strategy mode, trying to flip the game on Sam and Mark, which I appreciate as I was wondering if this was going to be a season where Sam and Mark completely dominate without ever being targeted. While Jordy does try to rally the troops against Sam, it seemed like the core of Mark and Sam, Josh and Jordan and Chrissy plus David were tight, with Chrissy and David being massive swings, but not ever seeming to take flipping seriously, likely due to their inexperience with Survivor. David does seem slightly more active, however, as when Jordy approaches him about flipping, he says he's already hatched a plan, but he can't flip yet. This has causes Jordy to go into desperation mood by revealing to David that Chrissy and Josh and Jordan then that Jesse gave Sam his idol. While I do like Jordy's idea of blowing up Sam's position by revealing she has the idol, the fact he adds that Jesse gave her the idol seems to be the problem as it's such an unbelievable move for a person as skilled at Survivor like Jesse to give his idol to Sam. It really seems that this is the issue that prevents people from flipping on Sam, and had Jordy said he knows Sam has an idol because he's seen it, still staying 100% truthful but concealing the harder to believe information, he could have been able to successfully flip people. Just before Tribal we get more Sam as paranoid content, with her clearly distressed at Jordy running around camp, talking to everyone, and I think at this moment Sam knew Jordy had exposed her idol. We then get to Tribal where Sam and Mark do a good job at unifying their majority by flipping the minority to be the bad people as they're causing chaos. 
but has quickly established to Tribal that there has been a line drawn in the sand with Michelle, KJ, Shay and Jordy being the minority for. Jordy also causes a live Tribal by going to different people and whispering to them individually in the hopes it would make them flip, which although a good idea made it blatant to me as the viewer that Jordy was clearly desperate and wasn't going to get his way. If it wasn't obvious enough that this was the case, Jordy calls out Mark's name as he spells it out on the parchment, probably because he wanted to try and burn his idol at least. The music was also a great this tribal with it beginning as the 2016 edition and then flipping to turmoil. But once again, despite having his name called out a tribal, Mark refuses to play his idol and the votes are red. Despite Mark receiving two votes and KJ receiving one, the remainder are put on Shay as she is eliminated from the game with zero confessionals. After Shay is eliminated, Jonathan has his usual closing line where he says if you think you're playing a team sport you're probably running in the wrong direction and I love Sam's comment of that's what you think, that's what you think as she tries to keep her majority united. However, the episode doesn't end there as Shay is put onto purgatory instead of being eliminated from the game which although the tribe couldn't account for this it was at least somewhat referenced with Jonathan's comment to Jordy and he doesn't refer to Shay as the fourth member of the jury, although he didn't say Mel was the second when she was voted out, so who knows. Anyway, Shay ends up on a variation of Redemption Rock. Episode 17 begins with Shay talking about ending up on Purgatory and getting some very generic content about how this gives her a second chance to the game. And then we get back to the camp where we get even more Jordy content. And while I enjoy Jordy as a character in this and the last episode, he gets basically as many confessionals as Jordan and Michelle over the entire season combined. Really, Australian Survivor needs to realise that more confessionals does not make us enjoy the character more, and I would much rather see content from the others, even if it's boring confessionals talking about camp life, rather than having the same confessionals appear time after time from the same person. But Jordy gets to call out Sam and his confessionals, as he did previously promise she would play Jesse's idol for him, which obviously was never going to happen. He then outlines his strategy in voting Mark as it allowed him to more effectively target Sam this tribal as the Jew will play the idol on Mark if worried rather than her. We also get some Chrissy content finally where she begins to see the light with Mark and Sam being massive threats in the game. We get content with Jordy and Josh in the water where Jordy asks him if anything has changed his mind to which he responds not yet which came off as quite narrow minded to me that he isn't even saying he'll think about it and keeping his options open. We also get more scenes about Sam being paranoid with Josh and Jordan discussing how she's putting a target on her back. This is also followed by Sam talking to Chrissy who really goes on this massive monologue about paranoia isn't paranoia if it's the truth and she gets this 20 second ramble about it which I don't know if it was edited but again added to the storyline of Sam being paranoid. We then get to the reward challenge where Jonathan announces they're playing for a car, but not just any car, Jordy's dream car. We even get KJ seeing she can fit all the kids in the car, which is funny to see as the majority of KJ's content comes from her in these challenges. That being said, it is fun to see the car reward return on Survivor, and the car curse also continues. We get to the reward challenge, which is an obstacle course to collect bags, followed by the usual wobbly table that contestants have to roll a ball down. Jordy takes the early lead with Mark behind, although a few times he goes for broke, which I find an odd strategy considering he was only one ball behind him for the majority of the challenge. But Jordy yet again wins this challenge, resulting in him winning four challenges now in a row, and although he puts an insane target on his back and has a reputation for the remainder of the season of being a challenge beast, if I were Jordy, I would be going all out in the challenges just to see how many I could win, because at this stage, barring any twists, cough cough, 
Jordy was a goner. So Jordy wins the car and it was sweet seeing him being so excited. And even when he's in the car, he's incredibly enthusiastic about it, which is probably the best sponsorship Isuzu could have gotten. By winning the challenge, he gets to take himself and three others down to watch a movie where he picks Jordan, David and Michelle. While I like the first two picks, I think he should have gone with Chrissy as the final option since she was a swing vote coming into this round. So the four of them drive off to the cinema and they sit down instead of watching a movie, they're watching videos from home. Well, it was sweet seeing everyone's loved ones on screen, especially David, because we got a Brianna cameo. I did find it funny how this reward had Michelle, Jordan, and David getting their loved one videos, perhaps the three most under-edited people at this point in the game. That being said, it was nice seeing Jordy get some personal content, where he outlines what happened to his stepmom. The immunity challenge is a classic where the contestants have to hold a pole above their head which contains an object and if they fall off the balancing beam or drop the object then they lose. Quickly this challenge comes down to Jordan and Jordy. Despite having a strong effort from Jordy, he drops causing Jordy to win immunity and I found it hilarious how instantly after winning the challenge, Josh, Chrissy and Mark surround and hug him which gives you all the insights you need to know about the tribal dynamics. After the challenge we re-establish the same storylines of Jordy, KJ and Michelle being on the bottom with Sam again acting extremely paranoid to the point she's even asking individuals in the minority what the plan is which comes off as rather needy and self-serving to me. Jordy then once again tries to go to Josh to flip him on Mark and Sam again bringing up Sam's idol. I also like Jordy appealing to Josh's ego by saying that the people in camp won't do anything unless he gives the orders, to which Josh responds, well yeah, we're the linchpins, you need us. Which although true is again another response from Josh that comes off as very blunt. Jordy and Sam then go away for a chat, which is awkward as you can expect, where Sam says, you don't know what happened between Jesse and I. Which I find funny considering Jesse told Jordy what happened on his way out and the fact Sam took Jesse's idol and then voted him out should say enough. Plus, Jordan is Jesse's brother. At Tribal we get the reveal of the jury, however Shay isn't there which Mark immediately notices. While a lot of people throw names at Josh and Chrissy like being boring and stupid for not voting out Mark or Sam, the fact they now know there's a Redemption Island twist makes it asinine to risk their games flipping on the duo rather than picking off the minority and working with whoever came back. This tribal is one of the more fun ones where we're constantly shown Jordy talking juxtaposing continuous shots of Sam shaking her head which I'm sure was edited by the show to make her look worse. Then Jordy makes the idol public a tribal which again didn't help his image in the game of being an untrustworthy and chaotic individual refers to Jordy later as the Joker because of this move. I don't see why Jordy made this public as he had already told everyone he needed to about Sam's idol resulting in only Sam and Mark learning about Jordy knowing about Sam's idol. Him also demanding for Sam to clear out her bag to prove she had the idol was a good idea but unlike Boston Rob and Winners at War, Jordy was never in the majority and therefore didn't have the authority for Sam to do it. Plus, Sam makes a pretty good comeback saying she will reveal her bag to the people back at camp tomorrow. That being said, I feel like Jordy acting so chaotically was reinforced somewhat by the perception that there was a Redemption Island, allowing him to put targets on Mark and Sam while having a safety net. So they quickly breeze through the voting phase where Jordy is eliminated unanimously after trying to eliminate Sam. After Jordy gets his torch snuffed, Jonathan then announces a twist that they're going to have immediately vote another person, which should be 100% clarity to those still left in the game that there is a redemption challenge looming, as Australian Survivor would never in a million years have two eliminations in an actual round where they were eliminating people. 
Despite some pre-vote whispering about getting Mark out, eventually the votes are cast and the majority stick together by voting out KJ. We begin episode 18 with a flashback to the previous episode and I love the imagery of the idle object crashing onto the sand as it adds to the gravitas of Jordy losing the challenge. We once again get back to Purgatory where Shay, hoping to beat people in the upcoming challenge, hopes for anyone but Jordy because anyone else is more beatable, which is ironic considering we all know Jordy has been voted out. Back in the game, however, the dynamics of this episode involve the core six and Michelle being on the outs, making me wonder why Michelle was so extremely underedited when she's the last one standing of her alliance. We also get this random heist scene from Sam transporting her idol into Mark's bag for no real reason, especially considering she never dumps her bag in the end like she said she'd do. I also find it incredibly risky that she does it right when Michelle is nearby. The edit then takes this opportunity to undermine Josh, who claims he doesn't think Sam has the idol, when the beginning of this episode is literally all about her idol. In spite of this, I also found it interesting that despite not trusting Jordy when it came to Sam's idol, they trusted him when it came to Mark's, yet they don't even consider burning it. We also get further insight from Josh explaining why him and Jordan haven't voted out Mark and Sam and it's because they don't want to have the target of being the last standing duo, which makes sense especially since at least one person returns for Redemption Rock in their mind. We then get to a really early immunity challenge 9 minutes in, indicating to me that the editors didn't really have much content to showcase this round, with the challenge taking up an enormous 11 minutes of the episode. The challenge itself is the strangest of the season by a long shot, where the competitors had to undertake an obstacle course to gather 3 rings and throw them onto a post. The first three to compete that section then had to move on to a final three tournament where they had to light items on fire making what Jonathan calls fireballs to launch into a pit where the person to land the first two fireballs would win immunity. So Josh, Mark and Jordan get to the final three of this challenge and begin throwing their fireballs confirming my suspicions. This challenge is straight up way too unsafe. Like you'd think since the Roscoe situation in Champions vs Contenders 2, the challenge designers would be extra cautious when designing challenges, but no. Like we have so many issues, such as these men carrying these massive lances, which they could accidentally hit each other with, and not to mention a fireball could very easily fall out of the mechanism, since I highly doubt Josh, Jordan or Mark have had no prior experience in their life flinging a fireball for, with a massive lance. But they begin the challenge flinging the fireballs and you can tell it's a nightmare for Jonathan to commentate as he's having to watch three guys all at once flinging their fireballs making it very difficult to establish who is scoring and not. But Mark wins the challenge which was nice to see considering we never obviously saw him win an immunity challenge in season 2. While I do respect Jonathan telling the cast about purgatory he is way too vague about it. I know, after ranting hours about talking about Jonathan spilling too much information at points, but all he tells them is that they're going to be voting for someone to become the fourth person in Purgatory when they're essentially in limbo. As we see from Mark as we get back to camp, it's really obnoxious for the players as they evidently aren't given enough information to establish what Purgatory is. Like they don't know what happens, how many return, as well as when do they know. Chrissy then gets a confessional and I really wonder if this is her playing up her goofiness by not knowing the word purgatory as this isn't even something survivor related. This is just knowing a word used in the real world and you don't even have to believe in purgatory to know what it means. We then get the breakdown of the tribe dynamics by the likes of Sam and David seems to be established as a very obvious sex in the alliance where quickly the vote comes down to him or Michelle. While it seemed there was genuine concern over David considering he wrote down Mark's name of the previous tribal, I never had any doubt in my mind that Michelle would go considering she was part of the majority four, considering she was part of the minority four and so the majority would be guaranteed to disrupt the minority four as at least one of them had to get eliminated through this twist. 
We get the tribal where again Khan, Mel, and Jesse come in by themselves for the fourth tribal now, which is very reminiscent to Loki, Harry, and All Stars, where they spent about an entire week together on Ponderosa because of all the non elimination episodes. I like how Jonathan asks Josh what the game plan is when it comes to the core six. And he says you win an immunity idol necklace, a comment I personally find funny. We also get this weird comment where Jonathan says even if Sam doesn't have an idol, it's public knowledge Sam does have one, does that automatically make Sam an even bigger target? Essentially confirming Mark's idol. Sure it can be argued Jonathan was stating the perception of Mark having an idol, but previously in the tribal he used if Mark has an idol, so it felt weird for this to suddenly become an absolute. Outside of that, we get some talk, particularly from Josh, who is afraid of Geordi's challenge capabilities in the comeback challenge. Josh also seems to be doing a lot of work during this tribal to ensure the majority continues to vote for Michelle, as they ultimately do, resulting in the unanimous elimination of her. After a small bit of strategy talk on Purgatory where Jordy begs everyone to play their asses off when they return to the game, we get to the comeback challenge with the core six spectating. After some pre-challenge banter with Jordy, we get the showcase to the challenge, which honestly is one of the better cases for the majority, considering the main aspects exercised in this challenge were balance and luck. Jonathan also explains three will return into the game and the person who doesn't finish will be the fourth member of the jury. Josh then gets asked by Jonathan how he feels about Jordy having a 75% chance to return, to which, in classic blunt Josh fashion, he says, come on back and we'll send you back out Jordy, which screams agency. And just overall, there's a lot of content about them booting Jordy when he immediately returns, with David saying he has to go, even to the point the spectators cheer on everybody but Jordy in the challenge. But Jordy. In the challenge, Jordy finishes first, followed by Shay, and then KJ gets third place, resulting in Michelle just booted out of the game, having been booted officially. Michelle also for some reason has to burn her buff in the fire, which just seemed insulting. Jordy, Shay and KJ after that, however, then relight their torches and head on out with the core six. And so, for what seems like an eternity, we have Michelle, and what is there to say about her? She's not Mark, Sam or Jordy. I do feel bad for her, as she was one of the most under-edited players. That being said, I don't feel like she was the most entertaining person on the show, and it seemed her and Mel were casted because of their dynamic as twins, rather than being these individually large personalities. Episode 19 begins with a great statement from Chrissy, who says, You execute a plan to dismiss someone, you lie, you cheat, you deceive, only for them to come back, which is probably the perfect sentence to sum up Australian Survivor in a nutshell. We also get Sam doing a good job by putting a target on the minority three and explains to a group they've shared an experience and now are united. We also get this just straight up awful social gameplay from Jordy. You voted us out and now you have to vote us back out. That's exhausting. And Chrissy saying you're a visitor with an expired visa. Sam also it continues her usual shtick of asking who the minority are throwing out to David, who in one of the cutest and funniest responses of all time just says, I I idol. <laughs> well, I critiqued Jordy early on. I do like him going to Sam and saying, let me know if there's anything I can do, which although unlikely to work, still offers him a little more agency in the game. Overall, the beginning of this episode is edited abhorrently, where because people may think I'm overreacting, we're eight minutes in and literally only Sam and Jordy get confessionals. On a tribe of nine. 
We get to our reward challenge, where the Survivor Auction makes a return after its hiatus last season, and I do again love how Australian Survivor is carrying the torch on these old Survivor curses like the car reward and auction. We have a few notable moments like Jordan and Jonathan deciding to cheers each other with their beers, Josh retracts his bid for the first time in the auction's history, as him and David both put 500 on a burger, and the majority consistently bid for the advantage. Jordy and Mark go to rocks for a covered item that turns out to be steak. Sam bids on a covered item for toast. Shay goes straight to 300 despite knowing the majority are whispering about wanting an advantage and even says she probably should have started a bit lower in hindsight. KJ then bids on a tea set where a clue is hidden under the teapot which she manages to sneak away and I love how Survivor play with players expectations where they hide advantages in food like with Shawnee in Champions vs Contenders. Then we get to the letters from home where Shay bids on hers and wins but Jonathan makes a dilemma where she can either give up her letter or give someone else their letter which seemed very cruel to me but Shay obviously decides to give up her letter so everyone else can have one. Back at camp, we get everyone opening their letters from home, although everyone but Sam and Joy are skipped over initially, which again I find obnoxious. But then we get to Josh who opens this letter from his fiance, and it is a beautiful moment seeing him welling up at the fact his fiance is pregnant despite having IVF issues, and everyone is gathering around to place a hand on Josh or hug him, and it was very sweet. I also find it insane, Josh wouldn't have known about this had Shay not given up her letter and he wouldn't have known about it until the final four when his fiance calls and throughout this montage Shay gets three to four confessionals talking about how giving up her note and began to feel repetitive. However KJ got a clue to the advantage and I love the editing where Josh and Mark talk about there only being four full size meals with no advantages juxtaposing KJ finding her advantage. And this advantage, I mean, it's absolutely unfair. That's what it is, as directly after coming back from Purgatory, where three people return to the game, she gets an advantage that can either just so funnily send three people back to camp, meaning they can't vote or be voted for. This means she can either use the advantage to save her or her allies, or use it to get rid of three majority players, ensuring it worse the Purgatory 3 go to rocks. To further exemplify how this advantage was used to save the minority, it also has a clause stating it can be only used in the next two tribals, making it useless to a majority player trying to keep it until the final seven or six. The immunity challenge featured a swim, neck roll, grappling hook, and then a what I like to call Michelle Fitzgerald puzzle. I also love how throughout this challenge Jordy is just unbelievably perplexed and consistently asks what is going on. But Josh wins this immunity challenge which is great considering he already had his storyline built this episode and this episode really felt like his big episode. Which is great but it's also episode 19 and any chance of him winning have been extinguished episodes ago which made it blatant if anything he was being set up as this big end game player sniped out before the end. We then get back to camp where KJ talks about the different options she has when it comes to using the advantage as she, as she could save it or use it tonight. We also have another fantastic one-liner from David saying return to sender when it comes to booting Jordy. That being said, I also like Jordy when confronting Josh and Jordan once again, bringing up the two idols and telling them if you don't do it tonight you might as well write down your own name on the parchment, which, not gonna lie, is a pretty badass line. Jordy then pitches an idea of putting a 441 on Sam where he's willing to get idled out just to burn one of the idols with David even admitting Jordy is right and genuinely looks like he's considering flipping whereas Jordan and Josh aren't. Once again Jordy tries to put the votes onto Sam and I like that he tries putting the votes on Sam from here on out as is more than likely forces Sam to play the idol on herself causing Jordy to be true in the end. Sam and Mark also get a small segment talking about the idol situations and how many, if any, they want to bring to the Tribal Council. Although they consider bringing one, they ultimately land on none, likely in fear of again having to dump their bags to Tribal 
And again, they're not going to do a double elimination on Survivor unless it's a non-elimination round. So at worst, if one of them gets blindsided, Sam or Mark are returning to camp with two idols at their disposal. We get to Tribal where KJ really bursts to life, talking about needing a cup of tea and revealing her power to send three people back to camp. And I absolutely love how the camera zooms into Sam's face, clearly pissed at the amount of bullcrap that is occurring. With no idols on Mark or Sam and KJ playing her advantage, this makes the tribal interesting. KJ then, as I've already stated in my Australian Survivor Most Ingenious Move series, goes on the offensive with the advantage, taking out the majority of the majority, as she states. With no idols to protect Sam, Mark also makes an ingenious move by giving her some cloth in a bowl for Sam to bait as an idol. KJ then also explains her decision making to Jonathan by saying David would have gone had she, Shay and Jordy left. And this finally gives David the opportunity to flip, which seems he wanted to do this episode, but wasn't able to get the numbers with Jordan and Josh seeming to be unwilling to flip. With her allies gone, Sam begins to whisper to KJ and Jordy about making a move since she has the idol. And I know people say Sam comes off as far too nervous and sporadic for this to look legitimate, but I think the opposite. Like we've seen instances in these episodes ago where Jordy is literally existing in the game by talking to people and Sam is freaking out about it. For me, this is a good level of acting from Sam to pass off as legitimate, and it evidently works. Even though Sam votes for Jordy, who only gets two votes at this tribal, she isn't the one to receive votes. It's the other majority member, Jordan. And Jordan once again was another under-edited individual who did get some content pre-merge, but most of it felt situational, and he receives literally one confessional during the entirety of the merge, which was extremely situational, as was him in the cinema rewards getting a message from his brother. Most of his potential content seemed to go to Josh, and again, while I appreciate them giving Josh actual content, Jordan really should have been given at least like two confessionals from the Mel to Jordy tribals, as he was talked about a lot. Episode 20 begins with Josh, Chrissy, and Mark at camp during night, waiting for the return of their tribe mates, and then realise Jordan is gone, which seems to really anger Josh. We get Josh right out of the gate, identifying David as flipping, which was interesting. The next scenes really have this poking the bear feel to it, as people are making fun of Josh and Jordy, even states his cousin, Jordan, kissed me on the cheek. Later on, we get another incredible David moment where he says, the only doubles left are you two, so there will be consequences. <laughs> and then he just turns to glare at Mark. Sam then gets to talk about her acting in the last tribal that allowed her to save herself and credits that to her double degree in arts and law, which even the editors acknowledge is ridiculous with goofy music playing in the background. Josh, later in the episode, clearly realising KJ to be the one that played the advantage that caused his brother to go, wants her to be eliminated this tribal, however, Sam and Mark appear very resistant to this. While yes, Jordy would have been the best option for them to eliminate, not going through with KJ, further fractures the four, and could even explain why Josh makes his move this tribal. Chrissy also gets content this episode talking about how annoyed she is with Josh, so that's something. We then get into the immunity challenge where contestants have to roll a ball up a slope to knock down dominoes, and as a surprise no one tried to break this challenge like Adam Klein in Millennials vs Generation X by telling someone that when their ball was coming back down. But this is a fun and unique challenge that tests speed as well as hand-eye coordination. With there being a real risk to the competitors accidentally punching one of their blocks if they weren't careful. However, Sam wins this challenge which, off the bat, felt like the nail in the coffin for the misfits for me due to the fact Mark won immunity and the majority had two idols so if they wanted to, they could just force the minority to turn on each other. As we return to camp, we get an interesting Mark moment where he talks about how they're just here because of luck and we're here because of skill. And then he also goes on to say Josh is Harvey Dent and I'm the Dark Knight and between the two of us we're going to knock out the Joker, which felt like a very forced line from the producers as Jordy was the Joker in their mind and Josh gets a lot of content upon Jordan being eliminated upon being Two-Face. 
And while I was fine with Jordy calling himself the Joker, this just started to become ridiculous, as I even referenced this in the Ingenious Move series, it became more like Batman than Survivor. We also get to Tribal, where David has this great whole one minute monologue, pulling Sam through the mud, telling the tribe she's an award winning actress, only for Sam to whisper to Josh, I don't think Dave is with us. We get a bit of whispering from David, Chrissy and Josh, talking about Sam, and we also get a cute interaction between Jesse and Jordan on the jury, talking about if Josh will actually flip. The potential of Josh flipping is then further exaggerated by him clearly lying to Mark about a conversation with David where he says David is saying he's 100% on board with us but I don't know if he is when we clearly were shown he was talking about Sam. Throughout this tribal as well Chrissy does something fairly unique in that she judges the jury by how they react and look at the tribe as they're being asked questions and in particular she gauges Jordan's reactions. We yet again see JLP confirming Mark's idol, which again shouldn't be a thing, as it was never proven. Jordy as well does well this tribal, keeping the heat on Mark and Sam by constantly referencing their two idols. After the votes are cast, Jonathan asks if anyone has an idol, to which Josh whispers to Mark about playing the idol on Sam. However, when asked by Mark, he doesn't give a good enough response and they time out, resulting in Mark not playing the idol on Sam and her getting eliminated 5-3 as Josh flips his vote onto Sam, which admittedly plays into his two-faced persona well. Jesse also gets a fun line after the elimination saying that was flipping epic, which was a nice touch by the editing team. So Sam really surprised me this season, as I was unsure if she would learn from season 2, but she clearly showed she had. Her strategy had improved, and unlike season 2, she seemed more self-aware this season. Sure, she was paranoid, and often did what Mark told her, but she was always able to identify that. And while Mark obviously overshadows her this season, she still had phenomenal moments this season, like being a swing with Jesse on the Blood Tribe, and, most notably, her convincing Jesse to give her his idol. That being said, Sam's booth this season felt very reminiscent to Shan's boot in Survivor 41, where both these ladies were big players with the biggest edits in the game, and while their boots were entertaining and satisfying, they both felt like final bosses. This was problematic for Australian Survivor, of course, as Sam going left no doubt in my mind that Mark was winning the game, and this was at the final seven. The only other person outside of Mark with a clear and consistent narrative was Jordy, but there's absolutely no endgame scenario for Jordy outside of getting a large immunity run. In episode 21, we begin with Mark who has this aggressive music being played over him as he says he doesn't want to get hugged, and this aggression even continues later on as he keeps cutting off Josh when he tries to speak. This then leads to one of Mark's most notable lines as he targets Jordy stating he's a trained gardener, I'm a trained killer. And while some people find this cringy, I personally enjoyed this line as a way of showing his rivalry of Jordy while reaffirming their professions. Josh then gets an opportunity to justify his move at the tribal council where he says that Mark didn't trust him by not playing the idol on Sam therefore meaning his flip was valid. Although it was extremely obvious at this stage of the game that Sam or Mark wanted one of them to get to the end, and this is even reaffirmed in Sam's ex-interviews, but also logically you'd assume the husband and wife would mutually benefit from the money irrespective of who won in the end. So Mark losing Sam was fine for the couple as a whole as it ensured he had two idols at his disposal. We also get a funny editing moment where KJ says it's a lovely morning just for there to be this awkward silence. Another cool form of storytelling also happens non-verbally this episode as Mark walks off as the camera zooms into the This Holiday Sucks hat. Mark then gets more content this episode as he gets more personal content and then strategic content by saying he has two hidden immunity idols which apparently is a first and unheard of except David had two idols in All Stars, and Simon had two idols in Brains vs Brawn. 
This then leads to David beginning to receive a target this episode, as someone in the middle with a solid strategic game, which is ironic considering we hardly knew who David was a few episodes ago. Finally, Mark then has this extremely heroic, if I'm going to get to the end, I'm going to win quote, which not so subtly foreshadowed his win. The reward challenge required players to hang off a beam while holding on to a rope, where the person who wins could pick themselves and two others to go on a spa retreat, where the three girls in Shay, Chrissy and KJ begin talking about a spa day for the girls, and especially Shay seems fond of this idea. Lo and behold, Shay is in the final three with Jordy and Josh, where Jordy offers the win to Shay if him and Josh get to go with her, which Shay agrees to foolishly, and the two boys jump in causing Shay to win. This really puts Shay into an awkward spot, as she now either has to break her promise to the girls or the boys. Jonathan also gets a cute comment jabbing Shay for picking Josh and Jordy by asking, this has always been part of the plan? And you can see from that moment, KJ resents Shay by being on the verge of tears as she gets denied the spa day, and she also shakes her head as Shay leaves the challenge site. We get to the spa where Jordy gets a lot of strategic content, where he talks about the Shay move being one of his best moves in the game, as it forced Shay to burn bridges, and while it's true, he's also aligned with Shay, thus causing his purgatory trio to become cracked, as KJ seeks revenge. Josh also says, I'm not going to promise a final three or anything, da da da, but we can work together to ensure each side doesn't get the votes. And while I like the idea, again, Josh phrases this horribly, as he could have just said about him working together with the duo, but instead shoots himself in the foot by openly denying wanting to go into the final three with them. Finally, I also like the cool snake imagery, as the self-identified Joker Jordy and Two-Faced Josh talk. Back at camp we have chaos erupting, and in spite of this I love Mark just smiling there while saying yeah. Mark then again, for some reason, outside of his confessionals, brings up if it bleeds we can kill it, which just seemed like a line a bit too over the top about just wanting to vote out Geordie, and even Chrissy nervously laughs about how she's happy Mark likes her. We get to the immunity challenge, where Chrissy straight up admits Shay's decision for who to pick at the spa may have been a half a million dollar mistake, and even initially Chrissy refuses to look at the trio. The immunity challenge features untying knots, throwing sandbags into a bucket, and then doing a word puzzle, which is nice considering Australian Survivor are known for their very physical seasons with very few puzzles. Something I also love during this challenge is Jordy and Josh just laughing and smiling throughout it, which is nice to see considering just how many days they had been on Survivor at this point. But Josh wins immunity yet again, making him safe and Mark vulnerable. We get back to camp with a few Josh strategy scenes, and I find it interesting that none of his two opening confessionals consist of him in the same attire. As his first confessional, he's wearing a backward cap, then a hat, and then an immunity necklace. So at least three different confessionals were shot on different days, if not on different stages of the game. We then get a conversation with Josh and Chrissy, where Josh informs her he's working with Jordy for the next two rounds, and they need to go after Mark, and initially Chrissy is extremely dismissive of this idea of getting Mark out, as she had an idol earlier in the season, knows it's powerful, and Mark has one idol everyone knows about, and has been confirmed by even JLP. We get KJ who has very evidently flipped away from Shay and Jordy, but gets this good content about letting the boys fight it out so the girls will be good at the end. Mark then begins interrogating Shay to get information out of her, where Shay basically tells him he needs to play his idol tonight, and I love how Mark thinks he's a master manipulator after this scene, saying loose lips sink ships, and I now know Shay is gunning for me, which is just Shay obviously trying to burn Mark's idol. So the vote at camp quickly boils down to Mark with either David or Jordy as the backups in case he plays his idol. At Tribal we get Jonathan saying let's talk about rewards and I love how instantly KJ shakes her head. Even David calls Shay out for her risky behaviour which at that point when David is calling you out for something strategically you have to really evaluate your decision making. Jordy continues to go on the offensive this Tribal calling out Mark for his two idols, as well as his ability to win challenges, and even calls him out as a threat. We then get Jonathan and Josh 
just out of nowhere having a conversation about Mark, where Josh talks about him potentially winning a challenge, and Jonathan identifying if he did that he's in the final four, which I just find funny considering it seems more like players in the game talking rather than a host and a contestant. Jonathan then also asks Josh a leading question where he asks him who is the bigger threat, Jordy or Mark, so that's something. Everyone goes to vote and they put a lot of emphasis on Mark during this voting round where he's the last to vote and has the most drawn out voting scene. Jonathan then asks if anyone has an idol and Mark finally plays his own idol. The first idol play of the merge and blocks three votes with David receiving two and Jordy receiving two from David and Chrissy. Everyone goes to a revote where KJ surprisingly flips her vote to Jordy and Mark gets a voting confessional about voting out David. Jonathan then reveals the votes as 4 to one on David and he's eliminated from the game. But David was someone who I really enjoyed on the show with so many small funny moments and great character moments. While he did struggle in the early game, it only seemed to be the case because Brianna was eliminated and after the swap he seemed to find his footing in the game. For not having much knowledge of Survivor, it did surprise me how strong of a game David was playing in the end game by calling out Mark and Sam as well as flipping to the Purgatory 3 which did majorly improve his resume to the point he's seen as one of the biggest threats left in the game. I think it goes without saying, I'd love to see Juicy Dave on the show again, as he fills the older man archetype while still being good in challenges. I just wish he was edited a bit more consistently, as his only content comes from episode 3, 4 and then 16 and on. After David's elimination, we get to episode 22, where once again we get Joker Jordy back in full swing, talking about surviving tribal, Although he does get strategic content as he recognises that KJ tried to blindside him. Although KJ plays this off well by acting like she didn't know what was happening and apologising. Jordy then keeps at his usual trick of trying to convince Josh that Mark has a second idol. Chrissy gets a lot of growth content in her confessionals. And although people may say this is good for Chrissy, all it does is cement the fact she's either someone taken out just before the end or a losing finalist. Mark then gets to outline his decision making for the previous tribal where David was eliminated on revote. And while I do understand Mark saying David was a massive threat, Jordy is too and I feel like this is one of Mark's biggest slip ups in the game. Sure it works out for him, but bringing someone as dangerous as Jordy, who actively has been trying to eliminate him for the entire game, is extremely risky and puts all the power, if anything, into Josh's hands. It could be argued he kept Jordy around for a shield, but evidently he was doing that with Josh, and having two shields in the final six is a dangerous way to play the game, especially because Jordy, even identified by Mark, is good at challenges. He had the potential to win the final three immunities. We then get more Jordy content reaffirming his best play of the season in his mind, taking Shay to the spa, and although yes it allows him to bond with Josh, I feel like Josh would have sided with Jordy anyway. Especially considering he blindsided Sam the previous tribal. So all Jordy gets out of the spa is KJ going after him. Mark then also reveals his intention with the second idol is to idol out Jordy, which is ironic considering it was originally his brother Jesse's idol. We get to the challenge where for some reason they all have backpacks on. Jonathan then addresses the fact that all the original Blood Tribe members have been voted out and there are now only original water, which is a pretty interesting statistic. The challenge features a climbing course with a rung climb, a ladder climb and then finally a puzzle. The challenge eventually comes down to the puzzle where Chrissy decides to help Josh by identifying what pieces Mark had down and telling Josh which ones to pick up. Obviously she couldn't pick them up herself but aided Josh in the win which does feel a bit bittersweet as although Chrissy makes an ingenious move you're not really supposed to do this in an immunity challenge as it could quickly become the majority helping each other to beat a minority member rather than it being fair across the board. But Josh wins his third individual immunity and the second in a row resulting in him being identified as a threat. We get back to camp where Jordy tries to rally the troops once again on Mark and calls it a shoe in for a vote. 
even though he knows Mark has another idol. I feel like it's also good strategic play from Josh at this point to ask Jordy about the fine print of their Final Five agreement, which makes sense considering he is in the swing position this tribal. I also like Mark pulling KG aside, identifying her as the clear third of the Purgatory 3 and someone who had previously written down Jordy's name. Jordy and Josh also have a pretty impactful conversation where Jordy asks Josh if he's down to do Mark and Josh responds, I have to weigh things up, which I think let Jordy know the writing was on the wall as up to this point Josh seemed very opinionated where he would say he was with a person only to now be unsure. Jordy then chats to Chrissy about getting out Mark and again as someone who knows Mark has another idol he comes off as way too confident about being able to vote out Mark which seems to devalue his argument of Mark having the idol. To the point Chrissy even says Jordy how in God's name are you going to get Mark out when you're saying he has the idol. Just before the tribal we then get a Jordy and Mark scene where they're discussing the game. I love how Jordy says he knows Mark has the idol only Mark to say what are you talking about and then shoot him a grin. Jordy then pitches to Mark the idea of going for Shay which really comes out of left field and originally I thought this was Jordy trying to potentially cause a 3-2-1 so him Shay and Josh could vote Mark out. But in hindsight this was a desperate last attempt by Jordy to survive and this scene probably wouldn't have been included if it wasn't for the fact the editors needed to explain why Jordy votes for Shay at Tribal. So we get to Tribal Council where we have a lot of these tense conversations and talk about establishing a strong group after the vote. So everyone goes up to vote with Josh being set up as the decision maker. When JLP asks if anyone has the idol, Mark stands up and begins telling everyone the adventurous second idol has had, where it passed ownership from Jesse to Sam to him, and this just felt unnecessary, as instead of him trying to play it off like he found a second idol, he instead confirms Jordy's story. This makes him look bad for not only telling his close allies about an idol he's had for weeks, but also raises his threat level on his own accord. He then also has a line about how he'll be blocking all the votes this tribal and the runoff will knock Jordy out of the game which is brutal even Jonathan says as much but fully doesn't work out as Mark doesn't receive a single vote this tribal. You can even see Sam shaking her head as she's playing the idol as she knows he could have saved it but Jordy is eliminated unanimously after voting for Shay and is for good this time out of the game. And Jordy is probably the biggest player of the season and someone who I always find synonymous with Australian survivors blood versus water because he was such a big presence. Now he was a massive screen hog to the point he's eliminated with more confessionals than David, Jordan, Michelle, Jesse and Mel combined and in stereotypical Australian survivor ways had a lot of his confessionals becoming very repetitive. Like did we really need to hear about how he was the Joker 20 times? And while Jordy has a great mind for the game and clearly knows how to play optimally, I think the biggest problem is his people skills, where time after time he feels to properly convince the likes of Josh, Jordan and Chrissy to work with him to the point Mark and Sam just outplay him. But he was an entertaining person, a much needed villain on the show, and I mean we're obviously going to see him back on the next All-Star equivalent season because how could you not? So we start with Chrissy to begin episode 23 in a really jarring way. Typically we see Chrissy as this unaware somewhat social player but we just begin with her shrouded in maniacal chaos as she's going crazy over the fact she made top 5 on Survivor. Again, Survivor, the show she had never watched before coming out. She then proceeds to call Mark a silly little soldier for wasting his idol, although it could be argued it's negative content for Mark. It clearly comes off as very childish by Chrissy, making her lurk even worse. We then get to Mark who gets even more personal content, and considering how the only person to get personal content within the last few episodes was Josh, which again was very situational, made Mark even more obvious as a winner. We also get a lot of content, really out of nowhere, where Shay is this massive threat and absolutely has to go. We then get Josh and KJ talking about how she has to go as they play about a hundred yoga scenes from her. 
All of this really comes off as rushed storytelling, where KJ just gets a lot of content piled on her about being a threat to win the challenges and someone who could win the game. And I find it ironic that people are concerned about her prowess to win immunity challenges considering her and Mark had the same number of, of immunity wins and Josh had even more. So we get to the challenge where the edit made it very apparent that Shay had to win immunity or she's gone. Again, having actual Shay content and not Zero Confessionals last episode would have helped the storyline's transition, but it's Australian Survivor. They can't do that. The immunity challenge itself is Samotion, a challenge usually used in Survivor US at the end of the game, but this version was about four times the size, which just made the entire challenge feel awkward, as it took almost a minute for the ball to go from the top to the bottom. Chrissy and Josh once again attempt to do the challenge together by syncing up their balls, seemingly for the purpose of them being able to tell each other how much time they had before the next ball arrived. KJ misses the ball and is out first, and Josh goes out after that. He tries to mentor Chrissy, but the edit shows her being in the wrong, as she drops the ball far too early and gets out. Finally, Mark feels to fully catch his ball, and so is out as well, meaning Shay wins immunity, which so obviously comes out of nowhere. It's not like we had 15 minutes of build-up about Shay needing immunity for her to get it. Back at camp, we get more Shay content, but a lot of this comes off as them having to include it because she won the challenge. We interestingly see Shay then target Josh over Mark, presumably because she feels he is her biggest threat at the final immunity challenge. We also get an interesting conversation between Shay and Mark, where the two agree it is 100% Shay's move to get Josh this tribal. KJ then also has a great line in my opinion where she asks him what would Sam want you to do and gets him to admit that she would have wanted Josh out a long time ago. We also get the girls coming to Chrissy about voting Mark out but this seems to come as them trying to misplace Chrissy's vote rather than them actually going through with voting for Mark. The two guys and Mark and Josh also identify the need to stick together as the girls could easily take control. So going into tribal, it seems to be Josh or Mark for one side, and then KJ from the boys. We then get to tribal where Jonathan, as per usual, announces the jury, and he even addresses David as juicy, which comes off as a bit over the top, and he's literally calling David by his nickname, and not the name he's known as out of the game. We also get Josh going back to his usual ways of being extremely blunt, and straight up telling Shay if she didn't win immunity, she would have gotten voted out. Josh then begins whispering to Chrissy that it's an issue if she votes him out as she doesn't get to the end with Mark, which seems pretty desperate from Josh, and if I'm being honest, I thought Josh was the boot this tribal, just with how much setup there was for him being a massive threat in the game, and there was a lot of talk from the girls about targeting him. Chrissy also comes off as very dismissive towards Josh during their whispers. This leads to JLP asking Chrissy if she's voting with her head or her heart, to which in probably one of the funniest moments this season, she begins asking the jury what she can do, and obviously they can't respond, but she keeps asking them, causing Jonathan to remind her she can't ask the jury, which felt like a very surreal moment, and something we haven't seen on the show before. Jonathan then starts this pointless exercise with everyone, asking if they're voting with their head or heart, and then ends on Mark who says gut, which is funny because on top of the previous Chrissy stuff, you can tell Jonathan is getting pissed at the contestants for not properly answering his questions. So everyone goes to vote and Chrissy writes down Mark, making me think her and Josh were actually voting for Mark, but instead it's 2-2-1 where Josh and KJ are tied for the highest number of votes. And a revote occurs where, in a 2 to 1 vote, KJ is eliminated from the game as Chrissy flips her vote, presumably because she realised Shay and KJ were lying to her about the Mark vote. Mark also then votes for KJ, which I found interesting, meaning Josh narrowly survives the vote. I also find it annoying the show showed so many different Sam jury reactions to this tribal council, but none of Jordan's, even though, you know. Josh was the one actually in danger and nearly got voted out twice in this tribal. But now we're on to KJ, who I did have as my winner pick coming into the season, and she played largely like I expected, where she was this under the radar player that made some moves, but unfortunately that, and probably her emotional gameplay, caught up to her resulting in her elimination. But 
for the little amount of KJ content we did get. I liked her presence on the show, and she was absolutely fantastic during the final nine tribal with how she hammed up the advantage for the audience. I'm also really surprised they didn't lean into KJ's personal content more, as the only content we got from her was talking about her children at challenges, and there would have been easily a storyline with her trying to win for her children if so much of that personal content didn't go to Jordy. We begin the final episode with a small montage of the events that unfolded throughout the season, which was a nice touch. With Australian Survivor seasons being so long, you can often forget certain events that happen pre-merge, so I appreciate the editors reminding us of some of the bigger moves earlier in the season, such as the Sandra, Croc and Ben blindsides. They also really hype this Jesse move up as the most treacherous act in Australian Survivor. Jordy and Jesse get so much content too over this montage, but we get to the final four, and as much as I bash on Australian Survivor's editing, this opening was amazing, and again, this is why I'm so frustrated with Australian Survivor's editing, as usually because I know they can pull off this great editing like this. We see them firstly give each player a 20 to 30 second intro, giving them their titles and cinematic shots. Although I found it hilarious that Chrissy was listed as the social strategist, then the editors give us a confessional or two from the contestants, no more than a few seconds, where they got to sum up their experience, and Jonathan did a great job in the voiceovers as well, and sold these individual strengths and weaknesses well. I also find it funny how in all the intro pictures and videos, they make Shay wear the immunity necklace. After their smaller intros, we then get more personalised intros from each contestant as they wade through the land and the water to get their final challenge, which again, I loved as the contestants themselves got to break down their own games and had a good minute or two minutes explaining their games. I also find it interesting how Josh states he wants to go to the end with Chrissy and Mark, considering Again, Mark was such a big threat at this stage of the game. Chrissy again gets another growth arc comparing herself to day 46. But we get to Mark and I appreciate how the editors give him time to reflect on his 2017 game for a small moment before reflecting on his current game and talking about how he's changed. That was a nice touch. So we eventually got to the final immunity challenge which was really cool, I was hanging over this pool of water with many waterfalls streaming down as well. It was cool to see Jonathan actually mention to the cast as a final three this season instead of a final two before the challenge as they could have easily seen him saving the reveal of this twist until they got to the final three, again messing with everyone's strategies. We've known Australian Survivor has been wanting to expand to a final three in all stars and brains versus bronze but due to evacuations over these seasons it messed with their scheduling so this is the first time we'll actually have a final three it was a bit odd for the usual family visit to be replaced with a phone call from home which is likely done because of covid but it unfortunately didn't have the same level of gravitas as the families coming out and it even seemed like they had reception issues as people like mark really seemed to struggle to communicate with their loved ones at points after everyone gets their phone call, they get to the final immunity challenge where once again it seems like Shay has to win where the core three of Chrissy, Mark and Josh will make it to the end. Something I've covered in the Reigns of Pours immunity challenge guide to win series is yoga techniques for strenuous immunity challenges like these and I realised very early on that Shay would win this. While well, everyone had their eyes open and were looking around, she had hers closed and was meditating. And she also used the Amanda Kimmel strategy outlined by Peridium in his Amazing Challenge hack series where she flipped between using an overhand and underhand grip allowing her to put less strain on herself. I also love how Chrissy looking down at the bottom peg dumbfounded and saying I don't know how you do the last one, you must be horizontal. While everyone is chatting away to Jonathan I also like Shay's approach of ignoring him as he questions her. Overall, I really do love these very difficult endurance challenges at the end of Australian Survivor, as there is less objective skill involved in winning, and more so just willpower. So Chrissy drops, and then Josh, which causes Chrissy on the pontoon to say to him, if she wins, you might be in trouble, which is explicit foreshadowing to the final four. And then comes down to Mark and Shay, where eventually one of Mark's arms seem to lock up, 
and a goes in, resulting in Shay winning the final immunity. That makes her a four-time immunity winner, which puts her on par with others like Sean and Brian and Luke, and just behind Brooke. After Shay is awarded immunity, we get Mark saying tonight's vote is between Chrissy and Josh, and it's interesting to me that he doesn't even consider himself as an option for the vote, and this same confessional is even played later in the episode. So Josh and Mark head away from camp while Chrissy and Shay discuss the vote, to which Shay brings up Mark's name, which Chrissy seems open to considering. In her words, Josh won't vote for her. This then juxtaposes Josh telling Mark he's thought about a perfect plan where the two of them load up on Chrissy. With Josh and Chrissy working together all game, this seemed like a very bold move. Sure, I can understand his rationale for guaranteeing whoever gets the votes him or Mark, they can make it to the final three since Chrissy won't ever win a fire making challenge, but even if he makes it to the end with Mark, it's not a guarantee he even beats him, with Shay and Chrissy being far easier competition. To make the plan even more risky, Josh then tries to get Shay and Chrissy to vote different people, resulting in a 2-1-1 vote, which just seems so dangerous, and really Josh puts the ball in Mark's court as he can easily rat him out, which I assume he does, considering the, how the votes play out, even though it's not shown on the show. Mark then gets more strategic content, like pulling down a curtain for a big reveal, as he states to us, the viewer, his game plan all along, through five weeks was to push Josh as the leader of the Alliance so we could use him as a shield. Now I feel he does take some liberties with the statement as Josh does play the middle in the Sam and David rounds which Mark couldn't have expected. Plus the storyline could have had more gravitas if Josh had more consistent edit as Mark saying this just resulted in the reaction of oh well that makes sense now why you got the consistent content and he didn't. But still, if it was Mark's strategy all along, he evidently succeeds. Chrissy then goes on before Tribal to say she should have Shay and Mark with her at the end, but she wants Josh. At Tribal, we get Jonathan referencing Chrissy voting for Mark the previous Tribal, which is just... Why? Like, why is Jonathan saying this is how it is? As if it's one person in the game saying someone did something or they did something but it's way different for Jonathan objectively to reference the vote as it comes off as an absolute that unfairly puts Chrissy on blast. We get more last minute whispering from Josh telling Chrissy to vote for Mark but this is ineffective as when they get to vote Josh writes down Chrissy. Chrissy writes down Josh with Shay and Mark voting also. We then get the vote reveal of one vote Chrissy and three votes Josh, with Mark flipping on Josh and resulting in him being the last member of the jury. And Josh was a massive player this season and definitely had a good mind for the game, resulting in him probably winning a Shea Chrissy Josh final three. But again, his content was incredibly lacking pre merge. And while, yes, he wasn't the most interesting presence on the show, he still had good insight into the game. And I mean, they gave lots of content and confessionals to Season 1 Lee. Let me just reiterate that. Season 1 Lee. So they should have been able to give it to Josh, irrespective of if they weren't hamming it up for the camera. However, I feel like Josh, due to being so under-edited, has been established as underrated by the community, where people feel like he's this triple threat figure with the best non-winning game, which I don't entirely agree with. He's great strategically and physically, obviously, and socially he did form good bonds with Mark, Shay, and then eventually Chrissy, but I have the same issue with Josh's overall social game as like a Jackie Peterson or even George Vladinov from last season, where they do well socially with people in their core group, and around the same height on the totem pole. However, he comes off as very dismissive and almost arrogant to people either in the minority or evidently lower down than him, as he tells people like Mel and Michelle they're going home. He tells Shay if she didn't win immunity she would have gone home and has no qualms with having no filter. So while I wouldn't rank him as highly as a Sean in Champions vs Contenders or L in 2016, I think he's naturally good at most facets of the game in Survivor, and if he can just work on how he approaches the minority, we could easily be looking at a David Janat 2.0.
But day 47 swings around and I love after an intense tribal and an intense game as complex as Survivor, the first thing we get is a scene of Chrissy accidentally burning her socks, which was a nice way to break up the competitive episode. Mark then gets more personal content about overcoming fear, which then leads to a scene where he, Shay and Chrissy go for a walk only for him to end up at a river, which reminds him of a battle where he lost one of his men, and it was a very touching moment. Just personally, I think it's hard for individuals like myself to imagine the trauma that can happen in a soldier's life, and we got some insight into it with Ben Dreebergen, who obviously is a Marine. So it's nice for him to share one of his stories, and also ends up putting a positive spin on things, saying the next time he looks at a river he'll think of Survivor and not of Wars, and from a game perspective again, it's more Mark personal content. So they return to camp, only for them to be mountains of food, making me think Shay's walk was perhaps planned. We then get some Shay personal content finally, and although far shorter than Mark's, I did like her message of inspiring young women by being on the show. Chrissy then gets more journey edit content, and then says her name never came up this game, which is a great showing of her social game. Which is then immediately undermined by her saying she did receive votes at the first week, as well as her receiving votes literally last tribal. And for any future Survivor players, just because you don't receive any votes, it doesn't mean your social game is off the charts good. So after these three pieces of personal content, we get the tribal where Jonathan breaks down the format, the fact it's an open forum, and they, the jury, will go to vote, which was explained well. We begin with Mark choosing to outline his 2017 game first, and talking about he and Sam didn't want to be the couple that blew up their game. And I love his quote about, we all came in with our own battles, but I won the war, which is a fantastic line to convey gravitas, and it also relates to Mark's military background. He outlines Andy as his first move, where he could have ridden his coattails, but voted him out. And then he gets the jury. While I do like him addressing the big players in the jury, I can't help but notice they're only the men he addresses as big threats, coming off as a little sexist. He then addresses Khan as a great player and references a statistic about how Khan held onto an idol for a record setting 21 days, which really puts Khan on a pedestal, making Khan more inclined to vote for him while also showing to the jury why he made the can move and why he was considered a threat by Mark. Mark then talks about his dilemma with Sam on whether to go with Jesse and Jordy or Josh and Jordan and picks the latter because Jordy and Jesse were big game players and the fact he says they complement each other perfectly like yin and yang was a nice touch too. Finally he gets to Josh where he talks about using him as a shield further justifying his motive for picking Josh and Jordan, but this also showcases his foresight and strategy in the game, as he says he built Josh as the leader of their alliance for 30 days, so he could use him as a shield. I, sh I like Shay who speaks next and takes a completely different approach in presenting herself as the counter to Mark, who may have burned people with a self-professed, dominant and strategy-heavy gameplay. She instead backs up her physical game wherein she states to me the essence of Survivor is to fight, she also says how she was a major underdog in the game. I also like her yoga pose throughout the tribal as it does a great job at physically embodying what she is saying. She proceeds to say I had to fight my way through and use my physical strength against all odds and I like how she brings up how she won four immunity challenges the most of the season. Finally we get to Chrissy who claims the emotional and social arguments and overall I think this final three does a good job of playing to their strengths and presenting their argument from a unique perspective. This is also later reaffirmed by Khan, identifying the three have very different games. Chrissy talks about how she left her three babies at home, and then says, I had one intention, and it was to play a social game, and how I have played a social game my whole life. I definitely wasn't going to be a physical threat, which again plays to her strength while reaffirming her job as a teacher to the jury. She also brings some facts, and overall, I was actually surprised at how strong of a pitch Chrissy made, also referencing, I have attended more tribal councils than all of you, I attended 19. She then also proceeds to argue Brianna wrote down my name on the 5th day and I didn't get my name written down until the 41st day. 
I also like how she brings up her loyalty to Jesse and that she was willing to go against her blood, Croc, to protect him. She also does a good job at talking to Josh, saying you will be family even if you don't want to be, like I know you will be my family after this, as well as you taught me all the big moves and you were my big move. She then does a good job at identifying the jury, such as how Jordy gave her humour on the island, KJ reminded her of doing it for the kids, and she has a good closing sentence in If I can take a tiny bit of you with me to represent Soul Survivor, my job here is done. We then get into the jury phase with some opening can content, and KJ has a great question for Chrissy in Do you think putting those like Josh and Mark ahead of your game may have jeopardized it in some way, flipping her emotive social stance against her? However, Chrissy gives a good response, saying she was very loyal to her first and foremost, and she was ultimately there for herself. Michelle then asks a good question to Shay, asking her to rate her game out of 10, to which Shay responds to 8, which causes Sam and Jesse to scrunch their faces up. And this is probably the worst answer by Shay, as she immediately starts off with a negative to her 8 out of 10 statement, saying, I know I wasn't in the majority, as well as the fact if you're on the jury, you're wanting the best person to represent your season. You're looking for a 10 out of 10, and not just settling for a self-professed 8 out of 10. So Shay waffles for a bit to prove she's an 8 out of 10. Before convincing herself, she actually played a better game than she initially thought, and in a funny moment, she decides to actually give herself an, an extra half point, resulting in her being an eight and a half, and even David gives off a puzzled look. Nonetheless, we get to Josh, who brings up Chrissy's entire family and loyalty ideology, only for her at the final four to throw him under the bus. Chrissy responds with, you wanted to talk strat, and I didn't want to talk strat, I just wanted to talk, which comes off as a bit too emotional as an initial response, but she saves it, in my opinion, by saying, you were different that day, and I knew you were coming for me, which causes Josh to shake his head, but he then comes off as a massive hypocrite by asking Mark afterwards why he didn't vote with him after he threw out Chrissy's name, which really just validates Chrissy's comment about knowing he was coming after her, which makes Josh's argument far less effective, as essentially he complains about Chrissy throwing him under the bus after admitting he threw her under the bus first. So really, yet again, it just highlights my issue with Josh's social game throughout the season. But once again, Mark gives a good response about when I talked to Harry that day, it was about supporting my family and allows him to take Chrissy's turf somewhat where he delves into the emotional family man background. Sam then asks a good question to Chrissy, asking what winning Survivor would mean for her, which is a great question considering Chrissy never watched the show beforehand, so it's essentially asking her what she learned from the time she had on the island. And overall, I like this final tribal format, where Jonathan asks a specific jury member for a question, they ask the question to a finalist, and the finalist responds, to then the other jury members where they can chime in if they wish, making it structured, but also have more of a personal and informal feel, which I like. Jesse essentially pulls a half Murphy, stating you came in here as an ex-SAS soldier, you're 115 kilo, 6 foot 3, you're a returning player, pulled off the first blind side of the game, and you were still underestimated. Then asks Mark how he can explain his game more, because people seem to just straight up underestimate him. Mark brings up keeping his physical profile low, and then brings up a statistic of his own, in that he didn't get his first vote for 31 days, and it was the longest stretch of time for any player. In spite of this, we don't get any questions or even discussion from David, Mel, or Jordan, which is unfortunate considering I would have loved to hear their perspective. The jury then gets up to vote, which is nice that they do it in order, beginning with Can. The only vote revealed was Sam voting for Mark, obviously, and a few other people get voting confessionals, but the packs of the parchment is shown, so we don't get to know the name of who they wrote down. So after this intense tribal where everyone votes, we then get to the vote rating. Nope. To completely kill the tension as per usual, the families are brought into the final tribal council, with Mark seeing his son and mother-in-law on screen, and I love how Sam has to awkwardly move into frame with the TV, and then immediately scurries away when Jonathan reveals they've also brought the family out to Mark. Shay gets her parents and Ben return, which is cool, and Christy gets her children out as well as Croc, so it's nice to see Ben and Croc make small cameo appearances, and Jonathan even gives Croc the opportunity to talk about Chrissy making it to the end. So Mark wins unanimously, and even receives a vote from David with Mark-J, which was a nice touch and a good send-off. 
And overall, we end on a lovely scene of the jury hugging the final three. So let's get to the final three, where we begin with Chrissy, who actually surprised me at this tribal council, and had it been a final two with her and Shay, I would have voted for Chrissy over her. She did have a strong argument at the final tribal, and the fact she was able to reference statistics to bolster her argument was also impressive. That being said, she did very little throughout the game for herself, where allies of hers like Josh and David display more agency and flip sides. Really, throughout most of the game, she just attached herself to Mark and Josh and was willing to get dragged through most of the game because of them. She does try to make a move on Mark at 5, but at that stage it's far too late, and even on that occasion, KJ and Shay were lying to her. That being said, Chrissy was one of the more entertaining people on the show, albeit because of her clumsiness, either generally or in relation to not knowing anything about Survivor. I did find it annoying how she did zero Survivor research before coming out in the show, to the point at the first Tribal Council she doesn't know about them having to vote on parchments. She was a lot of fun and again fought back at Final Tribal, but ultimately her fate was sealed by going to the end with Mark and Josh where essentially she just became a kingmaker. We then have Shay, who had a very quiet edit this season despite making it to the Final Tribal. A lot of her personal content seemed to get taken away by Ben when they were shown on screen as a couple and even as a member of the Purgatory 3, she got almost all of her potential content taken by Jordy or KJ. And unlike the other two, she never seemed to just go for it and get out a threat leading to her Final Tribal performance where she admits in just as many words she wasn't able to get anyone out by her own command. Again, contrast is to KJ who stole the show when it came to the Final Nine and Jordy then follows that up by blindsiding Sam 5-3, his biggest enemy. The other two members of the Purgatory 3 were just outplaying her. Really, Shay never had a firm footing in the game and she was on the bottom of her initial try with Brianna and then got targeted alongside Ben at the swap. All she ended up having at the end to set herself apart from Mark and Chrissy is her immunity wins, which although impressive is only one aspect of the game, it just seemed like she got way too complacent with her position and let the others make the moves while she observed. And then we get to Mark who for me, currently, is probably the second best winner in Australian Survivor, closely behind David Janat. Again, Jesse sums it up perfectly as him being a massive physical threat and returning player, yet getting to the end. He had such good threat management. While sure his gameplay was boring at the merge, where he was picking off people on the bottom, had the purgatory twist not been in the game, he makes it to the final six with two idols and is the second best at challenges. I know Mark has gotten critique on the show and out of the show for not playing his idol on Sam at the final eight, but realistically all they needed to do was make it to the end and it made all the sense in the world for Mark to let go of Sam as it diminishes his threat level and allows him sole access to two idols at the final seven. Like, at the end of the day, their husband and wife. Whichever one of them wins will be getting the money for their family. I also want to shout out Mark for being the first original pre-merge boot to go on to win and that's never been seen before. Overall Mark dominated all three facets of the game and again the fact he manages to make it through the final four round with no votes despite having played two idols, being a returning player and having a fantastic backstory is just incredible. That being said, Mark does have some hiccups in his game like being outplayed by Josh at the final eight causing Josh to have more agency at the final seven than him, him misplaying the idol at the final six. And also, again, I don't agree with him voting David over Jordy personally at that final seven round. But again, the only reason he ends up in this mess after the final nine is because of the purgatory twist, plus KJ getting an overpowered advantage. I think he's also very fortunate that in this season it had a final three, since Shay would have likely won the last challenge and was definitely going to vote him out over Chrissy. Although it can be argued by doing the Maz in the game, Mark could have established this season as having a final three. But that's my recap of the season, and I'm now into some final thoughts before I end this video. So let's start with the positives. As per usual, I like the Australian Survivor format, with more people and even longer days, as now with four female winners and three male winners, the gender win ratios are very even, far more even than Survivor US and the format facilitates playing under the radar as a more viable strategy than in America. We also have great sound design and the cinematic shots of the landscape are great. There are some extremely humorous scenes to me, and again, that's just my opinion. Some of you may have not found this season humorous, since humour is entirely subjective. 
but it really speaks volumes when I find more humour and enjoyment from David solely on screen than almost all of the Survivor 41 cast. It's good to see more diverse casting on the season, as well as Survivor Australia continuing its diverse casting of ages, which I appreciate. Finally, props to Jonathan for being such a good sport throughout the season, and rather than being just a Jeff copycat, he, can, he continues to add his own personality to the show by being slightly more informal and is able to joke around with the contestants. I also think he handled the medical situations very well, as I'm sure it can be a nightmare trying to host a TV show while also worrying about people's safety, and again there were so many instances of these. Nina, Croc, Shay, Sam and Alex. Now on to the negatives of the season. Oh boy. Firstly, I think this is one of the weaker casts on the show, with it being evident that some groups were cast because of their dynamic rather than individual players, or one individual was cast because Survivor Australia really wanted their loved one to compete. I mean, we had Mel, Michelle, Jay, Alex, Kate, Jordan, Shay, and somewhat Ben plus Josh that just didn't turn out to be that interesting on TV and therefore were ignored at stretches of the game. In fact, this cast probably has one of, if not the biggest number of duds in the franchise. We also get a really bad food order this season, where a lot of the bigger names and characters like Andy, Brianna, Sandra, Sophie, Amy, Nina, Croc and Can all get eliminated before the halfway line, resulting in Jordy, Sam and Mark carrying the season for the other half. We also have typical Survivor Australia problems, such as bloated episode length, repetitive storylines such as Jordy trying to convince people for five episodes straight about Mark having the second idol, repetitive confessionals like Jordy saying he was the Joker 20 times, inconsistent editing where people would have zero confessionals one episode and 17 the next, or be set up to be big characters like Nina, Chrissy, Shay, David and Croc, only to receive these massive dry patches of content. I know some people liked the final three twists this season, and while it was a nice change of pace, it's clear they just struggled to edit the tribal down to fit three people rather than the typical two. Like, she barely gets any content, and about two thirds of the screen time goes to Mark, killing all the suspense about who the winner is. Plus, with the exception of All Stars, the final two tribals seem closer, as the two finalists are generally well edited, making the final battle more satisfying. Compared to the final three of this season, where Chrissy's edit died off the first half of the merge, and Shay has more zeros in her confessional chart than you'll see in a coding class. It also means we get another non-elimination episode to facilitate a final three, which is never good. While good gameplay by the majority through the final 10 to 7 to pick off the minority, it was extremely boring and probably the most boring and predictable episode stretch in all of Australian Survivor's 10 play series. We also have characters that are just completely bloated confessional wise like Jordy, Sam, Jesse and Mark, while other people like KJ, Shay and Josh have far less content despite lasting longer than the former three. Had the season been edited with any sort of consistency, it would have likely been better. The gameplay was also rather stagnant, with again the majority for the most part of the season just picked off the minority, and with Sam and Mark holding on to their idols, it meant no new idols were being redispersed, meaning the minority didn't have advantages to shake up the game. It also hurts that there were only two successful idol plays this season, resulting in less entertaining tribals. So overall this season wasn't one I enjoyed massively, but I'll get to that more in my eventual season ranking. But that's me. Thanks for watching. Let me know down in the comments if there's anything I missed. Also, don't forget to subscribe as it means a lot to me. And I put a lot, a lot, a lot of time into this video. So please subscribe. Uh, but anyway, have a good day. And peace. I'm, uh, I'm going to have a lie down now.